Hello, everyone, and welcome to Curse of Strahd Twice Bitten. Thank you all for your patience, and bef let's see. So, uh, I am Dragon Akarta, your host and DM. Uh, thank you to everyone for continuing to tune in to everyone's favorite gothic horror campaign. Um, before we get started today, uh, I think we just had a quick note from our dear Serena. Serena, if you wanted to quickly uh, get that out of the way. Heck yeah. So we want to hear from you. If you have a mo, please fill out our audience survey at tinyurl.com slash twice bitten poll. Uh, big thanks to everyone who's filled it out so far. We really, really appreciate all of the awesome feedback that we've gotten. Absolutely. And seconded, thank you to everyone who has filled it out so far. You guys have been so supportive and we want to do whatever we can to uh, thank you for that. So, uh, with that, uh, we don't have too many announcements at the moment. I'm sure we'll have more after the break. Uh, but for now, let's not uh, waste any time and let's dive right in and get started with Curse of Strahd, Twice Bitten. Welcome back, everyone. And with that, I think we are ready to get started. So, last we left off on Curse of Strahd, Twice Bitten. Left adrift in the lonely village of Barovia, our five travelers made new allies of Ismark Kolyanovich and Irina Kolyana, the children of the late village burgomaster. As they took shelter at the burgomaster's manor, the party learned that Irina had been pursued by Strahd von Zarevich, the vampiric lord of Castle Ravenloft, his pursuit forcing them to fortify their home into a shelter from the vampire's minions and beasts. After a delicious pancake breakfast and a brief but unsuccessful shopping trip, several members of the party journeyed to the eastern Barovian gates, seeking some hope of escape. Instead, they found only a familiar wall of deadly choking fog sealing their exit, and the distant howls of wolves. Disturbed and despairing, they returned to the village, though not before spotting a suspicious character skulking and watching them from the village alleys. Now sure in the knowledge that retreat was impossible and the only path ahead lay forward, the party agreed to help Ismark transport Irina to the fortified village of Velaki, for her protection. At Irina's request, they helped transport the Burgomaster's corpse to the local church for burial, and there they met Father Donovich, a priest who agreed to perform the last rites for the Burgomaster at dawn, and as they arrived and departed they heard the shrieks of a creature that lay beneath the chapel's floorboards. That night, as, as Amity enjoyed the distant dreams of a leftover dream pastry, her peaceful slumber soon became a nightmarish vision. In her dream, she saw herself fleeing a monstrous black wolf and was left with more questions than answers about the dream's meaning. And so, as morning comes, Amity, you awaken exhausted. You feel a weight on your shoulder and see a hand resting there, Ismark's, his kind face 
peering down at you from over your bed as he gently nudges you into wakefulness. The bed beside you is empty, no sign of Kiva, and outside your window the sky is still dark, though you can see shades of lightning gray in the distance. His mark above you offers an apologetic smile. My apologies, the others were already up and I thought I should wake you. It is nearly dawn. Are you uh, ready to go? Emdy wakes up uh, with a hard breath, wipes the salt water off of her eyes. Um, Roy, the funeral, uh, let's go. She rapidly wiggles her entire body and then sits up. This Mark puts a hand out, just attempting to steady her. It's, it is, are you all right? Do you need a hand with anything? Um, she reaches for the cane. I'm good. Might not be able to carry the coffin, though. <laughs> not a worry at all, believe me. Your presence alone is a great comfort. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind, I'll give you a few moments to uh, wake yourself up. Uh, the others are downstairs uh, in the drawing room. Uh, we'll see you down there in a few minutes. We should be able to get to the church uh, before supper. Well, before dawn. He nods and bows his head and uh, backs out of the room, leaving you uh, some respectful space. Is there anything that anyone is doing downstairs or as they are waking up as this occurs? Uh, Metreon is nursing a bit of a hangover. Uh, so he's just kind of in the quiet, quietest part of the kitchen or dining room area. Um, just kind of like having a, a bit of wine and a bit of water. Um, if there was any kind of like bread or something, he's probably snacking on that too. Um, but he's just like, he's visibly uh, pained right now. Kiva right, has, uh, has sort of redonned her leather armor and she sort of wrapped herself up respectfully in her cloak and sort of covered her hair and everything to try to be as neutral as possible for the funeral proceedings and she's just sort of um, pacing back and forth by the front door of the house. Earthrendir's curled up by the hearth fire with his book open and a fountain pen and a bit of parchment just kind of stare looking from one to the other before scribbling scribbling frantically you can see a large number of cross outs and blottings at the edges lillison is joining erthrendir in fireside book club although she is once again trying not to get too too close to him she has her book out she is getting so close to the fire that you know she might actually be in danger of having her clothes catch on fire and she is uh, taking notes in her book as well. All right, Amity, is there anything you'd like to do upstairs, or are you going to make your way downstairs uh, as soon as you're ready? Uh, she'll make her way downstairs. All right, you do so, and there find uh, Ismark and Irina uh, standing with your friends. You can see Irina has obtained a... Uh, um, is just, you know, passing around some uh, small bits of food. You see, you know, Metron, you take a bit of bread and, you know, happily nibble on it. Um, Irina's uh, expression is a bit, uh, a bit conflicted, but she looks grateful when, with a nod of her head, she says, Good morning, Amity. Um, I just wanted, I was just letting the others know. Um, thank you all for uh, doing this for us. It means a lot. Yeah, um... Amity yawns, because I just remembered uh, that the previous dream did not even count as sleeping or long rest, and so Amity is currently exhausted. Um, so she sort of long yawns and leans on her cane. <sighs> no problem. Uh, I'm I'm there for you. Oi, uh, 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 Amity, uh, did you did you sleep? at all I, it's, it, you just and he starts to point at his under eye bags and uh, motions towards her face in a similar fashion yeah i slept i slept um it's just i still feel really tired <laughs> she will be both oh. and uh 
before they leave, <sighs> Metreon's going to remember to dig through his disguise kit and, and apply the appropriate pigments. All right. This mark uh, gives Amity a bit of a worried look, but then nods and turns to the group. All right, then. Are you all uh, set to go? Yeah, sort of two minutes before rise. Jolts up, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I'm ready. He nods and moving together with the others amongst you, uh, takes up one corner of the coffin, one side, and hefts it into the air. Uh, who is helping him? Sorry, no, not the coffin. The coffin is at the church. Uh, he uh, gives you a nod from the empty drawing room and uh, begins making his way toward the, the front door of the manor, slowly leading you outside. On the way out the door, Lillison will actually maneuver herself to get a little closer to Metreon and just whisper, wasn't there something you wanted to retrieve? Should we go get that on the way back? Huh? Well, what are you talking about? You said the banner, your performance banner. Oh, shit. Uh, uh, yes, uh, well, we should probably get it after this uh, funeral business. Thank you for the reminder, though nods and then drifts away back towards the uh, back of the procession again. Yeah, Mitrion's drifting towards the back, uh, probably keeping a bit in pace with Amity and Truffle. Um, and is just, yeah, uh, sluggishly moving along. Together you make your way out the front door with Ismark and into the muddy, misty streets of Barovia once more. As you do, uh, Kiva and Lillison, you immediately notice these swarms of the swarm of bats that you had seen taking up roost on the uh, gutters and shingles and uh, boarded up windows of the houses around the manor, watching you with great interest, their tiny red eyes glinting in the dark light. And as you turn northward away from the manor, several of them chirp quietly and begin fluttering along taking up positions on roofs and signs ahead as they watch you pass through the streets, others moving up to, to meet them as you continue your way forward. Kiva grips both her backpack and her scimitar just a little bit tighter and keeps her, but keeps her gaze forward towards the church. His mark eyes the bat somewhat balefully and mutters a curse to himself. Damn it. I'm sure we won't be free of them for some time. Certainly not until we get out of Barovia. Are they a problem? Like an invasive species or something? They are servants of the devil. The so animals? long as night remains, he nods. A vampire like the devil can summon creatures to do its bidding. Wolves, vermin like bats and mice and rats. It's... They are his creatures. Hearthrendir shudders. Well, uh... Did not know that. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. That's not a little terrifying. It did. It could be worse. I am hoping that it is not, but he could be among them as well. And he keeps his voice down, glancing up somewhat suspiciously at the bats fluttering around. You're a... You're kidding me. That... That's a thing they can do? He nods solemnly. There are many things that the vampire is capable of. Let us keep moving. It'd be better that we are inside. Well, yes, we yes, evidently. <laughs> He continues moving forward, his pace picking up a bit more briskly as the bats continue following behind, slowly making their way from rooftop to rooftop as we move through the small village. Before long, you come upon it once more, making your way through the northern streets until you come to see the old church, scarred, broken, and weathered standing up against the edge 
of the towering mountain at the edge of the village. You can hear the faint drizzle echoing through the space. And you can see the a faint glimmering light seeping through the windows and holes in the roof. His mark gives a nod and offers you a grim smile. All right, let us uh, get this through as easily as we can. And he moves to push the doors open. Seeing him do that and kind of seeing kind of how dour is Mark and Irina have been, Arthur is going to drop to the back of the line and sidle up to Amity. Hey, uh, you got a weird question for you. Yeah? You feel awake enough to help me with something? I was just a translating and going through some old stuff and I kind of wanted to do something to help say kind of thank you to Bismarck and Irina and I uh, thought you might be able to help and he pulls the piece of parchment on in his pocket that he'd been scribbling on and shows it to her uh, Amity studies uh, this for a few seconds uh, uh, that's a great idea, of, of, of course. All right. If is, if you can put a tune to it, then I'll follow your lead. Good. Thank you. And he'll catch back up. He'll ha hand the parchment to her and catch back up with the others. As he does, you hear the great groaning and creaking of the wooden doors as his mark pushes the claw-marked fire-scarred wood open revealing the unlit mildew seeping hall beyond. You can see the flickering light of the chapel and the space beyond, and you can hear once more the familiar voice of Father Donovich reciting a steady, frantic prayer that echoes through the rafters. And as you do, you hear a young man's voice now familiar to you scream, I'M SO HUNGRY! PLEASE! Metron immediately grips his the handle of his hand crossbow and is keeping his hand firmly there uh, as they're going into the church. You watch as Mark's hand reflexively go to his longsword and then he exhales slowly, nods to himself, and proceeds forward. As you make your way forward through the hall following Ismark's lead, you hear... You can first see the familiar form of Father Donovich, his soiled robes covering his shoulders and form, unchanged since the previous day, as he kneels before the altar, lost in thought. His face is turned away from you, and you can see that the Burgomaster's coffin is lying on the floor a few feet away from him. And as you step into the chapel, you hear, Father, please! A shriek that then recedes into wordless screams and echoing sobs that slowly fade into a despair of nothingness. Good lord. Father. Father Donovich makes no movement. Metreon takes out his hand crossbow. I... Sir, excuse me, we're here for the funeral. He starts, and you see his head lift up at the more severe tone. Slowly, as if every joint in his body pains him to do so, he stands, moving off of his knees and steadying himself on the altar before him. Oh, yes. Yes, it's nearly dawn, isn't it? He turns toward you, and you see the dark bags under his eyes, the straggled gray-white hair pulled back tight over his scalp. Forgive me, I sometimes let time get away from me. You can see he's trembling slightly as he does, and another wordless wail from the floorboards below sends him cringing into himself. Yes, we we must get to work, mustn't we? Much, much to do. It has been prepared as you as you wished. He nods to the coffin. 
if you wouldn't mind assisting. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. And Erythrindir will do his very limp-limbed best to... He's trying, but he will get a, he will get his corner. Kiva will go assist on the other corner opposite of Erythrindir. Thank you! She'll just throw him a little wink and not say anything. Metreon's keeping his eye on Father Donovich. Uh, he's got his hand crossbow out, but he's kind of tucking it uh, towards the side of his jacket, says to kind of sort of conceal it, but not really. Um, but he, he's, he's just wanting to check and see, like, because he saw him wince when he, uh, there was that screaming. Uh, is there any other, like, telltale that he's picking up on? Any other kind of reaction? Uh, what are you looking for specifically? Um, I want to know if it's more like, because I see that he's tired and maybe a bit crazed. I want to know if it's like, if he's uh, feeling uh, either guilt or like, just kind of like trying to read his emotional state when he, when the screaming starts. Sure. Give me an insight check. Uh, 14. 14. There seems to be... Guilt is a bit difficult to detect in the state he's in. He's utterly a mess, and it seems more like there's a... He feel he seems haunted, and there's, an ex, there's a bit of despair written across his face, not actively, but just a passive sense of resignation, and just rotten his features and his eyes, and the whole countenance of his posture is just a haunted, terrible look. Okay. And as he makes his way past, you can hear him muttering... Don't worry, Doru. It'll all be all right. Don't worry, Doru. Don't worry, Doru. Just mumbling to himself over and over again as he passes you. Melissa looks between Metreon and Father Donovich and places herself kind of between them uh, unobtrusively and says, Will this ceremony be performed in here or outside? Or I'm sorry, I don't really know your customs yet. He points first to the door of the church and then to the space behind the chapel. I have prepared a suitable place for his slumber. And you can see that he's now holding a, a, a rusted shovel with a slightly bit of uh, soiled earth on one end. It seems to have been recently used. He slowly nods to himself. Yes, he will sleep well there. Follow me. And he just turns ah. and begins walking slowly toward the church exit. Yes, all right. Um, uh, Metreon, do you want to take a corner, get this uh, going faster, perhaps? Um, yes, yes, of course. He yeah, smirks, nods so. with a, a grateful, small smile, takes his own uh, side, and together the group of you begins moving the coffin forward, following Donovich's slow stagger toward the exit of the church. He leads you outside, past the front of the church and around to the back to three of you, a familiar location. You can see here a fence of wrought iron with a rusty gate enclosing the rectangular plot of land that is the quiet cemetery that three of you visited on a previous occasion. You can see the tightly packed gravestones shrouded by fog, the names of souls long past engraved upon them. And as you watch, Father Donovich slowly reaches for the gate and opens it as it shrieks in protest pushes it aside and then slowly makes his way in, the mists parting at his slow, unsteady gait. And as he proceeds forward, you can see that he appears to be headed toward a fresh, empty plot that has, seems to have been recently dug on the eastern side. It's a good space. Good, good choice. As you say that, you hear slight chirps and squeaks, and you turn and you can see the swarm of bats now perched atop the outer rafters and the belfry and the shingles of the church. 
still watching, still lurking in the darkness of the early morning hours. Kiva whispers to Arthrandir and just says, um, I thought this was supposed to be hallowed ground. If the bats are working for the vampire, wouldn't that keep them away? I honestly am not familiar with the interaction. I didn't know animals could be evil or, you know, something that could be kept away by hollow grounds. I have no idea how any of that interacts, quite frankly. But hopefully that means he's not among them. That would be bad. Yeah, that would be uh, quite a damper on things. I'm half tempted. I'm half tempted to throw a firebolt in the middle of them to break them up, but knowing our luck, it had set the church on fire. Yeah, maybe let's wait until we're on the road before we set the church on fire. I. I don't disagree that we shouldn't, though, with whatever's living in the basement. Metreon whispers, "Can we just throw them in now?" <laughs> no, no, we got to do this right. We owe them that much. Well, of this, you see well, Donovich round on the gravestone and gesture to the side. You can see that there is a deep hole dug in the earth and already present on the far side of the grave, a headstone engraved with the name Kolian Indirovich, Burgermaster of Barovia, beloved father and husband. He nods gravely. Whenever you are ready, we shall... Enter him to his rest. Arthur Deer looks to Ismark. Is there a anything you'd like to say? Ismark nods. Once we have placed him, just a, a few quick words. I don't oh. want to take too much time. Of course. Together, you, you Donovich steps aside as the group of you following Ismark's lead slowly holds the coffin over the hole and then begins to lower it into the pit prepared there. Ismark steps back, Donovich offering him a respectful nod. At this, Ismark sighs, closes his eyes. He was as good a father as anyone could want, even... Without our mother, he did what he could at all times that he could to keep us safe. He gave... He gave us a home, a loving home, and he taught us all that he could. And even in his last days, he was working to keep us safe, to protect us from the horrors of darkness. He was a good man. He deserves better than this. But this Donovich nods, turning to him with some minor bit of sympathy on his face. Indeed, he was a good man, a good leader, and he raised you well and gave your sister a loving home. He will be missed. Donovich closes his eyes and turns toward the plot. Metreon hasn't been paying attention to any of this. He's been focused on the bats as well as the church itself to see if he hears anything else or to see if he, the bats are reacting in any kind of way that's not bat-like. Make a perception check. 18. They don't seem to be acting out of the ordinary. They seem to just be quietly hanging, watching you. There seems to be no activity. There, none of them seem to be, you know, feeding on any fruits or anything or hunting for insects. They're just hanging there and watching. Yeah, Metreon shudders a bit uh, and starts to, like, focus back on the funeral. At this Donovich... Holds up his hands. We shall now prepare to send him on his way to the world beyond. He closes his eyes and raises his palms higher in the air, 
his fingers outstretched, palms face up in a gesture of supplication. O oh, morning lord, lord of blessed light and patron of new beginnings, we commend into thy mercy and thy radiance, Master Kolion in Dirovich. Now departed hence from us and gone evermore into your glory. We beseech thee to grant unto him thy mercy and everlasting peace, as thee delivers him from this everlasting darkness into infinite light. In the from pestilence into growth, from shadow into day, and from death into new life. Grant him entrance into your land of light and joy in the fellowship of thy saints and the brilliance of thy presence. By your will and grace. And he bows his head and clasps his hands together, murmuring something under his breath before stepping away from the coffin. Emily sort of clears her throat. Um, assuming you worship a deity of the sun, uh, Erthrindir has a hymnal. If you would like, he's looking at Ismark and Irena. I thought it would be nice. Ismark nods. Of course. It would, whatever you... He just nods quietly. You can see that he seems to be, to be a bit choked up and is preferring to do his best not to speak right now. Understandable. Erthrandir looks to Amity and nods. You want to start us? Alright. Um, Amity uh, gathers behind the piece of paper with Erthrandir, uh, hums a little bit, and then goes... Though deepest darkness follows twilight, feel the spark of dawn within. For those wandering in the dark night, know the sun will rise again. Know the sun will rise again. Amen. Amen. You hear a stifled sob. Then you turn and you see Ismark with his hand over his face, his shoulders shaking very slightly. Erthendir's just going to step forward and put an arm around his shoulders. There. It's all right. Ismark swallows and you see his eyes are a bit blotchy. That was given. Well, I've heard that elves can be quite long lived. I'm sure you've seen many of these kinds of events, haven't you? More than I'd like. And more than I should, even at my age. He offers you a small look, a sad smile, and a nod. He wipes away the moisture from his eyes. Thank you. I know that You're welcome. Well, Irina was not here to hear it, but she would have loved it, and it it means quite a lot. And he turns to Amity and offers her the same sad smile. Really, it, it means so much. Thank you for everything. Amity gives a curt bow. At this, you see in the distance, the darkness of the Barovian light has begun to give way to lighter shades of gray. Dawn having begun as the song and the prayer have come to a close. Donovich turns and nods his head. Very well. Dawn has come. It is time for his rest to begin. And he turns to a shovel and slowly bit by bit begins covering the coffin with the mound of earth lying beside the plot. As Mark watches, his hands clenched tight, and 
Uh, Lillison, what's your passive insight? My passive insight? Uh, where is that located on the sheet? Uh, just 10 plus your insight modifier. Ah, uh, 13. Gotcha. Um, you can just slightly notice that Ismark's hands are clenched tight, almost knuckle white. His eyes clearing of moisture and his breathing slowing as his eyes close, his eyebrows furrowed, and as you watch bit by bit, Donovich fills in the grave until it's covered completely. He offers Ismark a slight bow, which Ismark returns. There's a moment of quiet in the graveyard, and then you hear the fluttering of leathery wings from above. You can see from the church the dozens of bats of the swarm chittering quietly to one another as they take flight, abandoning the roof of the structure and taking a loft into the sky above. You watch as they begin soaring into the brightening gray sky, flying up the side of the mountain in spiraling circles, cutting through clouds of lazily drifting mist, until you see them pierce through the mist cover around the top of the mountain and vanish into the silhouette of Castle Ravenloft. Listen, watch Will. the shudder goes through Donovich's body. Willison will step a little bit closer to Ismark and lower her voice a bit and say, If they are his servants, then let them at least bring back a report of how pious and devout a son you were to your most beloved father. He smiles and nods. <laughs> Let them see that there is more to his domain than hopelessness and despair. There are good memories, too. Damn right. Now this Donovich lets out a slow breath. Bad tidings indeed, and he looks at the last of the fading silhouettes of bats. A poor omen for a burial such as this. He shakes his head. May the morning lord guide the good boga master's spirit beyond. He turns to face you. I have heard of the troubles that have availed the Burgomaster's family as of late. Though I have been occupied with my own concerns, would that I could do more to help. He turns first toward Ismark, then his gaze, fixing upon each of you in turn. If you be friends of Ismark Kolyanovich and Irina Kolyana, and if you wish to honor the memory of Burgomaster Kolyon and Dirovich. Take the girl away. As far away from the castle as possible. His spirit deserves no less. Lillison smiles a little bit grimly. She looks at Donovich and then she steps away towards the grave. And she's going to kneel at the side of the headstone and sort of closing her eyes to whatever the others uh, are saying. She's going to whisper a few words to the gravestone. Right, I think that's it then. Is Mark nods. So. He turns to Father Donovich. Thank you, Father. I appreciate your advice. You watch as Donovich nods and then abruptly lurches forward, his hand grasping into almost a claw on his mark's shoulder, his eyes wide, almost bulging, and you see moisture glistening at his, the corners of his eyes. Please. I mean it. As far as you can. 
the Abbey of St. Markovia may still be a bastion of good. And if you can't, then, if nothing else, Volaki may be fortified enough to secure her safety. Anywhere but here. You must promise me. This mark glances back at the rest of you somewhat helplessly. We promise we'll do our best to keep her safe. L Let's Father get Darvich out of here. Abruptly sags as almost all of the life seems to go out of him, leaving nothing more than a sunken skeletal old man. And he closes his eyes and whispers, Good. Then at least one more may escape. And he ponders the headstone for a long, lingering moment. And then without even meeting your eyes, begins to make his way out of the cemetery, the shovel dragging along the ground beside him. I'm with Amdi. Let's go home. That makes three of us. But back to their home, at least. Yeah. It's better than the last home we went into. Speaking of which... We should Bill. get your banner. Yes. Are you sure we want to go back there? I mean... It's... I mean, I suppose it... It should be fine. I think we broke what was ever in... Whatever was in that house, but... Still. Metreon is looking off... In the distance... And there's just this, like, this moment of uh, very rare, quiet reflection and contemplation uh, for him. Uh, I, don't, I don't... Will I need it where we're going? Well, depends on if Kiva and the listen are right and we are stuck here for a long time. You might. Yeah, that was my thought, too. Yes, let's, uh, let's be off then. Yeah. <laughs> if it makes you feel better, then we can tie a rope around you, make sure it doesn't suck you in when you get close or something. Oddly enough, that doesn't make me feel better, but I appreciate the sentiment. <laughs> Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Metreon raises his cocks one eyebrow at you and just kind of glares and then walks away. You try to be helpful and this is what you get. And you will follow. As Mark nods and follows you forth, by now the silhouette of Father Donovich has left your vision, and as you pass forward out of the cemetery, you can hear the distant slam of the church doors. As you make your way forward, you hear Ismark murmuring to himself, and you see him scratch his chin, and he mutters, The Abbey of St. Markovia. Hmm. I had not considered... He shakes his head. No. We're lucky now. Is, is the Abbey that far out of uh, Velaki that we can't just go there instead? The Abbey, from what I know, is... well, it is within a, a village called Kresk that lies at the west end of the valley. It is a bit of a ways travel, further even than uh, Velaki. I confess I do not have much knowledge of this place, the, the father seemed to believe that there might be some good or holiness there, perhaps, but I do not know. For now, if we can get to Wallachie, I will be satisfied. After that, who knows? We can see what it's like when we get to Wallachie and then um, maybe head there instead. If it's actually holy, then maybe it'll be safer than Whatever this place seems to be. This mark offers you a small smile and then looks at Metron as he hears his voice. 
Oh no, I was just going to ask DM. Uh, as everyone's starting to pack up and, and leave, Metreon uh, glances back at the church. From the graveyard, uh, does he hear anything? Make a perception check. Uh, that's going to be an eight. <laughs> Nothing that you can hear. Yeah, he just kind of shudders and, and starts to walk and, and pace with the others. Still kind of keeping back towards Amity because uh, he knows that she's a little bit uh, slower right now. Well, if will be the last one to leave the graveside. And she looks rather troubled as she catches up to everybody else. Um, specifically walking closer to Kiva, she is going to say, You said you dwelt in a city. Was it, was it never winter for a while? Uh, yes, since I was, uh, a young girl. Don't you think it's strange that the leader of this town, the first citizen of this community should be buried and none of the people he led should be there for his funeral. I didn't want to say anything, but... And she very carefully, you know, makes sure that she's out of Ismark's earshot. Maybe he wasn't as beloved as everyone seems to think. Maybe, um... Maybe there just aren't any other people willing to go through this process, but it does seem awfully suspect that no one else would be here. Wilson just nods and drifts away again. Kiva also knowing that the party is now heading towards Death House is like actually behind Metreon and Amity. This is the absolute last place that she wants to be. So she's like definitely dragging her feet to get there and, and lingering far past the back of the party. So literally everyone is hanging back behind her. Yep. Here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, I want nothing to do with this ever again, actually. So she's she's distant. All right, Earthrendir gets about three quarters of the way to death at two Durst Manor before he turns around. I, uh, is, is everything all right? Do y'all, should I, are you, y'all feeling tired? No, no, we're, we're great. Um, we just, <sighs> you know, we're, some of us just didn't get as much rest as the others. Yeah. Well, understandable. And as he kind of turns the corner to where the Durst Manor lies, here, let me just, since y'all are sla flagging a bit, let me nip in and grab it. Won't be two seconds. And then he kind of thinks about what he said and shudders. If I go back, if for whatever reason I get sucked back in there, burn the house down. <laughs> and then, can he see the banner? Make a perception check. Oh boy. High rolls, high rolls, high rolls. 14. 14. Uh, Metreon, where did you leave the uh, banner bag? Uh, he would have just tossed it off the side, like off the side of the, uh, what's it called? The uh, the front gate. Uh, not the front gate, but the, uh, what's, what's the kind of gated door uh, called? Whatever portico? that was. Portico? Portico, yes, thank you. Uh, he yes. threw it off to the side of the portico when he went inside. Gotcha. So inside the portico or outside? Uh, outside. Gotcha. Uh, Erythrinder, you can faintly see just kind of tucked in the corner of the alleyway between the Durst house and the house beside it, uh, what appears to be the small, familiar size and shape of Metreon's satchel. Looking at the house itself, does it look any different or does it look the same as it did when we first came here? It looks very much the same as when you first saw it. All right. There's nothing disturbing or untoward about it that you can tell. Earthrender is going to kind of like set down in a sprinter stance about outside the alley, take a deep breath, and then just bolt in, snag the package in his arms, and just, as soon as he's got it, just dart out of there as quickly as he can and just pull up to the others, panting. 
Here you are. Yeah, cheers. Thanks a lot. And he takes the uh, the banner and like slings it over his shoulder and turns around to start walking towards uh, uh, Irina and his, his Sparks place. Gotcha. Let's go. Wilson smiles at Arthur Look, I don't want to spend any more time near that place than I have to. Oh, no, no, I... Yes, I completely understand. I was just thinking that you run very quickly for... Uh, uh, never mind. Nothing. No, no, come on. I want to hear the end of that sentence. Wilson speeds up to walk faster. Away. Erythrin Deer speeds up to keep... <laughs> come on, you're not going to hurt my feelings. I guarantee I've heard worse. Shakes her head, still smiling. You're gonna tell me eventually. Maybe eventually. not today, but eventually. That together, Metreon's banner now restored in Metreon. If you are you taking a moment to look at it, or you're just speed walking away from the house? Speed walking. He'll take a look at it once he's uh, in the safety of the uh, of Ismark's house. Very fair. With that, together you make your way as abruptly as you can away from the Durst house and through the main avenue of Barovia once more, passing through the main square and before long, arriving once more at the old Burgomaster's mansion. There is Ms. Mark knocks upon the door. Irina peers through and together you proceed inside into the safety of the old broken manor to the quiet and peace of the old structure. Outside you can see the sky has begun to lighten into the grays of morning, the overcast clouds and fog now covering the sky. As you do so, um, Lillison, Yes. Just a, a minor thought occurs to you. Just simply that it seems to be a very dreary land. You suddenly realize that you've not seen uh, any indication of sunlight or daylight or anything beyond dreary, overcast skies since you first came here a few days ago. That's all. Wilson will glance over at Ismark um, as they enter and say, I take it that this is some kind of rainy season here and we should not bother waiting for better weather to set up. He frowns. There is... It is not thundering. It is not freezing. And this is excellent weather. I'm not sure what your uh, concerns are. Oh, nothing in particular. Just if this is what you're used to, then I suppose there's uh, no delay to be had. He nods. Of course. Were you expecting different traveling weather? Well, I mean, it doesn't perpetually rain here, does it? It's been... Oh, no, it is not. Not always, no. Uh, Barovia is a dreary place, but, um, you know, sometimes it's it's just cloudy. We, we don't always have the rain. It's, it, it does get drier sometimes. Well, all right. And Lilson will hug her, um, whatever outer cloak she's wearing closer, and then go and stand by the fire again. All right. Irina gives a lot of you a small wave and a smile. Welcome back. It all went well, I hope. Uh, well, he's buried, uh, and seems to be safe for the for the time being. It was a beautiful. Dear and Amity sang uh, a lovely funeral song. You watch as some of the tension in her shoulders goes out, and she offers the two of you a, a genuine 
smile. Thank you. I know we've known you only for a short time, but you're... I, I just want you to know that we appreciate it. Thank you. Of course. Uh, so, question. Uh, how are we getting all of us to, uh, what is it, Valaki? Ismark nods. Yes, it is the journey of most of a day. If we leave within the hour, I think we should have no trouble arriving before uh, before uh, dusk. Um, we will take the old Swalich road. It, as far as I know, it leads through the valley and should take us right to Valaki. Yes, but what I'm asking though is because I, I don't think I saw any stables or a carriage. Uh, is uh, am I to we will... anticipate this will be on foot? He nods. We will uh, be walking. Oh, thank uh, God. Well, well, uh, and he kind of like winces a bit looking at Amity. Though I do not think that um, it would not be a rushed pace. Do not worry. We will make sure to. Uh, uh, we are not in such an enormous rush that we cannot uh, keep an eye on our uh, surroundings, yes? Yeah, we've got some hours of daylight to burn. We should be alright. Metron much, is displeased. <laughs> how much spare time do we have before we have to go? I, uh, I think that putting a bit of a disguise on Irina might be prudent. He uh, blinks and then... Yes, Metron? No, uh, Metreon, uh, hearing Lillison say that, uh, his, uh, his expression goes from kind of defeated to, uh, uh, kind of more alert, and, uh, oh, uh, yes, uh, does, that is a wise idea. If, uh, if you do need anything, and he starts to rifle through his disguise kit satchel, and, uh, pulls out just this kind of, like, tin of, uh, of shoe polish, can comb this through the hair, uh, darken it a bit, uh, and we can probably... Do some other cosmetic changes, perhaps maybe give you some scars, some extra freckles. Irina blinks. If you think it would help, then uh, sure. She kind of looks like a bit like helplessly at his mark, and he shrugs. Hey, he uh, managed to uh, cover up uh, some uh, tones that a uh, a Wistani would be ashamed to wear. I think that if you can do that, you can do anything, yes? Sorry, no no, no offense. Uh, None can... taken. Uh, and he gestures at his face. I, I think the coverage is good. I've yet to see anyone who can do a disguise as well as Metreon can. She's trying to comfort Irina in her really awkward, stupid way. Is Marcus still looking at Metron with that facial expression of, I just said something really rude, didn't I? And like trying his best <laughs> to do it. Um, Make it up to him. He kind of coughs and steps back. Metron winks at him. Well, all that disguise talk aside, do we still want to set a false trail? You know, give us a bit of time before the bats find us again. I don't think that's a stupid idea. I think it's actually probably the smartest thing we could do, given the circumstances. All yes, right. but how on foot? Uh, well, he kind of shuffles around. I can maintain a illusion of, if we bunch together, I believe all, he kind of mentally starts counting, seven of us, if we bunch together, I can keep an illusion of us. I can only keep that up for so long, like... Checking the spell. Uh, actually, Aetherin there. Yep. I don't know the limits of your magic, but would it be possible... Uh, did you say the other day that you could make somebody invisible? One person. For not too long, but yeah. Would it be possible to... I don't know, um... Make Irina invisible and at the same time create an image of her standing at the door and, and waving goodbye to us or something? No, regrettably not. I, uh, both of those would take all my focus. If we had someone else who could do one, then I could do the other, but sorry. 
Well, maybe if Irina is already disguised and you do the image of her standing at the door, that would be enough of a trick. Hmm. I think it would prove their uh, um, full most prying eyes. We would need, if they've been watching the house, then they know that we don't have an extra person. We'd need to fabricate some way for her to have come in. We've been watched this entire time. At least since last night. Yeah, I'm not too chuffed about it either. Well, I... One thing at a time, uh, my lady. And uh, Metroid extends his hand towards Irina and does like a little bit of a bow. She nods gratefully. All right, uh, whatever ideas you think are in store or that might help, I am uh, happy to uh, do what I can. Uh, makeup montage. Uh, Woo! Woo makeup montage, yeah. Uh, no, yeah, he's just gonna uh, use the same black shoe polish in her hair. Um, uh, and uh, if there are any scissors or any kind of sharper blades in the house, he'll maybe cut some of the hair off if she's okay with it. Um, but then he'll she like- winces a bit, but does not move to stop you. Whatever you think is best, I suppose. And Trust me, I'm, I'm, I'm a doctor. Uh, and yeah, he trims her hair a bit uh, and then kind of does some stuff to like give her freckles, uh, rose up the cheeks, make her look a little bit. Or actually, you know what? Uh, uh, it would be meta knowledge, never mind. Uh, so yeah, he just kind of makes her look a little bit more warm and, and bronzy and, and uh, freckled. She kind of winces a bit, but doesn't resist. Um, how short are you cutting the hair? Are we talking like Korra season four short? Are we talking like just past her shoulders? I don't know that reference, um, but uh, Natalie Portman in the professional. Uh, so kind of like chin length. I'll, I'll hold you to a Google for that. Gotcha. All right. Uh, Irina smiles uh, a bit balefully, but still nonetheless looking grateful all right That'll, uh, that 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 will do uh, thank you metrion we could split up like the five of us go off first to Velaki, and then um you leave a bit later catch up to us that's leaving her alone that's dangerous i could oh, stay <laughs> and and walk her later I've got the shield at least. It's something to keep us safe. Uh, I don't think that splitting into small groups will be the best idea. Um, no, I have I have a thought. How about we make her invisible just for the time that we have to leave? And then we'll um, all turn and wave to the open door. And from the inside of the door, I can uh, shut the door as if there was somebody inside. Perfect. Although we will need to be careful about footprints. We'll need somebody to carry her or something. Don't you think it'd be a bit obvious if someone is carrying something? I mean, unless we're just sort of positioning ourselves in a peculiar way. Point. I, that would be... Huh. If she walks in the center of us, maybe they won't notice the footprints. That so some of the footprints, they will all get scuffed and marked up anyway. Perhaps yeah. one of us can just walk in line behind her and, and muddy up the prints a bit. Or, Amity, could you just drag your tail behind us? That'll probably do the job. Of course. <laughs> Ooh, very good. Well, that's that. That's really started. smart. Thank you. Well then. Shall we get, shall we begin operation, get this woman well out of vampire reach? Because I'm excited for that. Is Mark and Irina exchange looks? Uh, just uh, a few more moments, just so we can uh, put everything together. Ah, right, you're moving out of your house. Of course. Dreadfully sorry. It, it's all right, not to worry. Uh, we will meet you in the uh, the drawing room, yes? That works. They nod, and uh, you make your way out as they make their way back into their own rooms. So, what the fuck was that screaming? Clearly he's got something or someone 
that refers to him as father, but maybe it's uh, just a parishioner or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. it, it was one scream away from me just fucking blasting a bolt in him. I don't know. I they Ismark mentioned something about some that happened a year ago, and I, I don't I don't know the full story, but I think there is some nasty there. I don't think we should go back and investigate, though. No offense, I feel like we've done oh, our no, civic none, duty of uh, helping taken. out strangers. I'm just <laughs> making more conversation than uh, was I uh, wasn't uh, proposing nothing. Yeah, yeah, no. Likewise, let's leave him and his uh, whatever to their stuff. The misery. That yes. By the way, Metreon. Yeah. If we are to be traveling with the two of them for some time. Do you plan to uh, cover up your accent for the entire journey with them? Uh, I, I haven't really thought about it. Uh, I suppose, yeah. Alright. I mean, I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah, no. We respect either way. She just gives him a knowing look. Uh, Metreon gives her a look back, but it's like that look of like, wait, why, why are you looking at me like that? Just <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet As it's like a monk your... thing. Yes. Oh. I bet it's no, like a monk first. thing. Like you know how monks do vows of like chastity, and maybe there's a vow of hunger. I I thought you were implying something very different there, love. I'm glad you finished that sentence. What did you think I was implying? It's not important. No, no, I'm curious now. What? What? Look, he mentioned a vow of chastity and there's someone tied up in the basement. I don't know. I've had a rough life. My mind goes to these places. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I feel wide. And she goes, oh. Yeah, that would make sense. No, that's that's not what I was implying, but I guess it could be that. No, love, you have a much purer mind, and um, just keep that. Keep <laughs> your heart and your spirit. Or don't. Join oh. the dark side. It's a beautiful place. At this point, you hear footsteps from the upper landing, and you see uh, Ismark slowly making his way down from the upper floor. You can see now that he has strapped on what appears to be a full set of splint armor. You can see uh, his longsword at his hip, uh, the scabbard and uh, turn to be readily accessible, the hilt poking up uh, past his hip. Uh, you can see strapped to uh, his shoulder a uh, large, uh, well-polished shield and poking over the back of his neck a uh, uh, large crossbow put in place alongside a quiver of several bolts. You see him you know, slowly pulling down and tightening a, a, a pair of hide gloves over his hands, kind of flexing the fingers and feeling them uh, creak and crack a bit before he makes Metri it to the bottom. Metreon goes from shooting daggers at... Uh... Erythrindir, and then like when he sees uh, Ismark coming down uh, Witcher style, uh, gives him a bit, a bit of that like, uh, text Avery whistle. Ismark. I do it, but I can't. That's a classic Ismark. reference. Raises an eyebrow at Metreon, and then glances toward the group. Alright, uh, I'm ready to go. Has Irina made her way down yet? Uh, don't Not think so. Yet, I don't think you hear footsteps from above. I'm coming. Give me one moment. And then you hear a bit more rushed uh, steps coming. And you see Irina making her way down one hand on the banister. She doesn't appear to be wearing full splint armor, but the first thing you notice is that she is now wearing a uh, polished chest plate over her upper torso. You recognize it as the one from her wardrobe, Metreon. You can see uh, uh, hitched, hitched to her side a... Uh, well-made uh, rapier, slightly tarnished with age, but nonetheless uh, hefted into a, a thin scabbard that runs down the length of her thigh, and behind her, tied around her neck and shoulders, uh, her crimson cloak, uh, the hood behind her head, tied tight around her neck as it flutters faintly as she makes her way down, her hand on the banister. Her, ha her hair somewhat uneasily shorter than she's used to. She, you see she has to kind of flip her head a little bit uh, to adjust the weight right, but she uh, nonetheless offers you a Bit of a small smile as she mounts the base of the landing. All right, I think we're ready to go. 
Metreon turns to Akiva and, and just with the most shitty eating grin on his face, uh, just kind of stares her down. Yes, uh, we're ready to go. You look um, amazing, by the way. The hair is lovely. Good job, Metreon. Thank you. Yeah, no, you did get do a great job with that on short notice. Speaking of which, uh, you ready to get invisible, ma'am? Oh, uh, yes, um, of course. Um, oh. Whatever you need to do. Sure. And he's going to talk to her and just kind of be a muttering. Now, it's going to mess with your depth perception real bad because you can't see your hands or your nose or any of your body. So take a minute to get used to your balance, else you'll be falling straight in the mud the moment you try and walk. And uh, remember, you, you are still perfectly audible. So walk lightly, don't talk much, and try not to get much... Try not to get much mud or anything on you. Follow these and you should be all right. And with that, he's going to take out his weathered old wand and trace the same increasingly complex elvish incantation in the air. And she vanishes. You hear a pause and then, whoa, that is, that, that is very strange. Yeah, yeah, take a minute get used to it, and then he's going to probably a... Hmm. Where are we right now? You're in kind of the side room where the coffin previously was, just off the entrance to the uh, manor, still inside. Are there windows? They are, but they're pretty heavily boarded up. There's no... In this room, at least, there's no clear view of the street. Okay, he breathed a sigh of relief. Okay, that would have been real stupid. Yeah, take a minute to get your barons in here, and then we'll be good. So this is this is what the magic is like. <laughs> it's huh, it's pretty neat. It's cool, it isn't it? Like could, <laughs> it is. Huh, all right, it, it's still it's still strange, um, but uh, I, I think I'm ready to go. Uh, whenever you are. All right. You ready, Lillison? Yes. Um, Lillison has. While everybody's been bantering, uh, she has gathered all of her stuff up rolled up her bedroll, put her book back, um, and is standing still, you know, near the fire, but reluctantly peels herself off and heads towards the door. All right. Let's go. And I'd say, too, that kind of, are we still kind of following a plan where we're, like, we're centering Irina and kind of walking around her? Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, Irina, um, walk in front of me uh, with your with your feet like lined up so that I can cover the footprints. Great, of course. Um, I'll I'll try to uh, stay close as I can. Sorry if I bump into any of you. I'll, I'll try to uh, uh, stay on balance. Lillison will cast Mage Hand quietly, you know, as quietly as she can and with increasingly smaller motions. Um, before she steps out from the door. All right, you can see the skeletal hand hovering for a moment on the inside side of the door and then duck slightly out of sight, concealing itself from the street, should it be opened. Well, Zach nods. shall we? Shall we? Of course. And with that together, you step out into the streets beyond the manor. As you do, making your way out onto the road, the the vertical avenue of Barovia, you can hear once more the familiar distant weeping, the familiar eternal drizzle that surrounds the dark silhouettes of these decrepit houses. The drizzle is lighter today. It's almost nearly dry, save for a few drops that at the top of your forehead as you make your way forward. As you do, Irina, to her credit, stays utterly silent to the point where you nearly forget that she's there as you make your way forward, information away from the house, down the central path, and through the front gates as his mark ushers each of you through before closing it shut. Um, Lillison would like to look around and see if there's either um, that brightly dressed person or bats or anybody watching them. 
Make a perception check. That is a five. Five. Uh, all right. So as you look around, the road itself is filled with mist and a thin layer of fog that drifts through the town. Thankfully, just uh, chill moisture, not the choking thickness of the fog you've seen at the borders. But as you do, you see a faint flicker of movement from one of the alleyways. Not the one where you saw the figure the previous day, but one adjacent to it, further to the north. And as you, you, do, you just faintly see a silhouette watching you from the edge of the alleyway, peering around the corner. Okay. Lilison will pretend that she didn't see that. Uh, turn and wave to the slightly open door. And then, uh, you know, as surreptitiously as she can, direct her mage hand to close the door from the inside. The door slams shut. And the house is quiet once more. Kiva, watching this, will say, sort of out loud, but not in the obvious way, Do you think she'll be alright in there without us? I don't think we've got a choice. We, you know, it sucks, but we have to do what we can for her. You're right. Let's get going so we can get back to her then. <laughs> you. <laughs> of course. One of you make a deception check with advantage. I want to do um, it. I want to try. <laughs> can, can I do it, actually? Okay, got uh, it. You're better. If you'd like to say something. Well... I think that if we set out and at a quick pace, we can get back. Well, it will be after evening, but what else can we do? Uh, with advantage, that is a 27. Woo! Yes. What? Yes, that's 20. 20. Yes. How? Wouldn't you like to know? I would! Oh, you have a plus seven deception. That's wild. I would very much. With that, Ismar kind of catching on nods. Indeed, I, I'm sure she'll be all right while we're gone. Now, if if you'd like to, I'll, I'll show you the, the way to the road. Yeah. And he motions for the party to continue forward. Yeah. Gladly. Uh, Lilith, you feel fairly confident in your ploy as you make your way past, and as you do, you see the... Uh, you get, a, for an instant, a better glimpse of the figure in the alleyway, still cloaked back in the shadows and mist, but you see a flicker of a, a deep blue and a flash of green from the darkness, um, a glint of silver, and what it seems to be a, a female silhouette just skulking in the alley, watching you go and for a moment, you see the head tilt faintly toward the manor as if to watch it for a fleeting moment. You feel a, a slight uh, smug bit of confidence in your chest and you can continue forward if you'd like. Oh, it's not slight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, following Ismark's lead, you trace the path forward, soon enough coming on a familiar avenue for some of you who followed a certain procession out of the village a day or so past. Coming upon the edge of the village, Ismark tucks uh, his thumbs into his belt buckle and slowly sucks into breath. All right. Time to... Uh... Under his breath, he mutters, time to say goodbye, I guess. For now. You'll be back. I know you will. He offers you a small, tight smile, then turns and begins making his way on the road ahead. In the distance, you can see the silver-blue ribbon of the river flowing through the valley, the mountains rising in the distance, cloaked in fog and mist, and behind you, still shrouded by the overcast clouds, the striking shadow of Castle Ravenloft. And as you make your way on the southwestern road, passing into the gray-green fields beyond the village and leaving the boundary behind, you see slowly, little by little, the castle vanishing behind the cover of mist until you see only a dark shadow and then nothing. And that is where we will take our break. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Rad.
So, uh, with that, we will take a moment here to break for a uh, brief 15-minute uh, break where we will pick everything back up. Um, until then, uh, just enjoy a few other messages from our D&D community. Uh, we do have a new episode of our Fireside Chat. Uh, this week, our guest with our producer, Shaplukas, is Lunch Break Heroes, the creator of the running Curse of Strahd YouTube series and a contributor uh, to one of our uh, messages during our break. He'll be speaking with uh, Shaplukas about his process for choosing what to keep and what to change when running a D&D module like Curse of Strahd. So I hope you all enjoy that. Uh, and we will see you all back here soon. Welcome to Fireside Chat, a short interlude with weekly features where I, your host Job Lucas, will be showcasing and interviewing prominent D&D creators. This week, we are talking to Lunch Break Heroes, the author of a cursor shot guide called Raising the Stakes, about choosing what and how to change in the cursor shot module. You're the author of Running Cross Strahd, a YouTube series that makes a number of modifications to the rules as written module. What does your channel try to do with these guides and why did you start it? Well, the mission of Lunch Break Heroes is to provide inspiration to dungeon masters around the world. Modules provide a narrative framework, but it can be loose at best and at worst it's disjointed. Putting all of those parts together into a coherent whole can be difficult and challenging and there's a lot of creative work that goes into it. It's fun work and I think all of us enjoy it to one degree or another but it takes time. And having an additional resource to draw upon and gain inspiration from is very helpful. It's extremely valuable to a lot of people. So it's our job at Lunch Break Heroes to take these modules create connections within the narrative, and change content to make things more interesting and engaging, and help you run the best game possible. I originally started Lunch Break Heroes back in December of 2018 just on a whim. I wanted to have my own D&D channel where I explained the rules of the game and helped people learn how to play it. Now, the first video I created was about death saving throws and it was absolutely god awful terrible. You can't actually view it anymore, it's not available. But right around the same time, I was also running a game of Lost Mine of Fandelver for my group at work, during our lunch break of course, and I was spending a lot of time searching around for ways to change up the module and make it better and extend the story, and I wasn't finding much on YouTube at all. I found a lot of stuff on Reddit, and that's still my go-to place for resources. But I saw this gap in YouTube, and I figured, hey, I could make this stuff, and people might actually watch it. I might find an audience with it, and I have. It turns out quite a few people come to YouTube and watch these guys, and it's been great. We're coming up on 10,000 subscribers now, and there's really no end in sight. It's been a fantastic ride for me, and I hope it goes on for a lot longer and across a lot more modules. Without getting into too many spoilers or details, what are some of the biggest flaws in the rules as written Grossostrad module? Well, its biggest flaw, aside from, you know, the typecasting of an entire race of people as evil drunkards, is really its staunch adherence to the original I-6 module from 1st edition. Now, granted, I understand that Curse of Strahd is an update of that adventure for the latest edition, but it's honestly a bit disappointing to look back at I-6 and realize just how little has changed within the village of Barovia and Castle Ravenloft. I mean, you pull them up, you put them side by side, and Irina is still there, and Ismark and Bildrath's Mercantile, Man Mary, the whole bit, it's all there one for one. 
and even in the castle, they've added a few tidbits here and there, but basically nothing has changed. Now, based on your opinion, that could be good, that could be bad, I think it's a little bit of a letdown, to be perfectly honest. Now, one of the biggest problems in this adherence is Irina herself. Now, for a lot of groups, she's not an easy character to run or even to like. If you've been browsing around the subreddit long enough, you'll see post after post after post asking about how to make Irina a likable character. Not even just a good character, but just somebody that their party likes. As soon as the players get into the village, they're basically given this escort quest for somebody that they're supposed to care about, but they've just met her. They don't care about her. And if there's one thing that gamers hate, it's escort quests. Irina is just this almost entirely blank slate beyond being just this damsel in distress. And that's a hard personality for DMs to work with when creating a three-dimensional character. So, unfortunately, I think the basic premise of Curse of Strahd, you know, keeping Irina safe, is probably its biggest weakness. What's your process for identifying potential issues and brainstorming fixes for them? Well, the way I approach it is actually kind of weird, I think. I liken each part of the adventure to a painting on a canvas. Have you ever seen it where people go to second-hand stores and they buy a cheap painting and then make their own modifications to it? That's kind of what I feel like I'm doing here. With some parts of the adventure, I'm filling in the empty spaces with more detail. Argon Vostal's a good example of that. With other parts, I'm adding extra bits around the outside or painting over parts entirely. The werewolf den is like a painting where I just basically cover up everything except the outlines. But on a more concrete level, I really try to look for gaps in the narrative. Empty spaces, characters without a background motivation, ideas that might seem connected but aren't explicitly so in the module. I also look for things that aren't fun or they're not as fun as they could be, and then I either take those out or I update them. And all of this, you know, I just try to fix it as best as I can and make it an adventure that I would really want to run, something that I would put at my table. And I think that speaks to a lot of people out there. What overall guidance would you give to a new Crystal Shroud Dungeon Master? What about a new Crystal Shroud player? Well, for the new DM, I have to say, read the module at least once and more if possible. It sounds like the most obvious piece of advice, but I think it's integral, especially for Curse of Strahd. There's so much interplay between the various chapters and so many callbacks that having it in your mind as a whole is imperative to running it to its fullest capabilities. You really have to internalize the whole narrative of the module. Now, whether you can do that without actually running the game, I'm not entirely sure, but give it a shot. Once you've read the thing as many times as you're comfortable with, I definitely watch my videos, for one, but check out all of the other guides out there. There's a massive amount of resources that you can draw inspiration from and just pull lots of little details from in order to make your game your own and make it better than you ever thought it could be. As for advice for players, be vulnerable, but don't let the darkness overtake you. Barovia is this bleak and dark place but I guarantee you can find little slivers of light here and there to hold on to. Those bits of light are going to help make this one of the most amazing stories that you'll ever take part in. What lessons have you learned in your efforts to start your channel and produce video-style D&D content on YouTube? For starters, it's really hard to differentiate yourself in this space. The number of bald white men who make videos about Dungeons & Dragons is staggering. But on a more serious note, I've really learned to listen to my audience. That's made all the difference. They come up with some of the best ideas, like offering written versions of my guides on Patreon. That wasn't my idea, that was a viewer's idea. And they even come up with some great ideas for other chapters as well. The audience is really the core of everything. And thankfully, the D&D community is a very positive one. The encouragement and enthusiasm that I see on a daily basis within the community is nothing short of amazing. I don't really see this in any other online community that I've ever really been a part of. There's really not a lot of toxicity, it's just a bunch of happy people that want to help each other out and want to tell great stories, and I'm very proud to be a part of it. If you think your hometown has problems, 
you haven't spent nearly enough time in the village of Barovia. Over the years, their taste for human flesh had only grown. The vampire spawn, the undead cult, the werewolf den. I just think we can do a little better here. Grab our shovels and we're gonna add some depth to help you run your best curse of straw. Strawn. 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 Possible. You're welcome. He flies into a fit of rage that is unparalleled. There's child abuse galore through this thing. He's been nailed to the wall with very long iron spikes, and I imagine it's been a very uncomfortable time for him. You see, in tracking a monster, one always needs proper bait.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Curse of Strahd Twice Bitten. Before we begin, as always, we just have a few quick announcements to get out of the way. Uh, first off, another shout out to our continued virtual tabletop sponsor since the beginning of this campaign, Foundry VTT. They're doing a lot of great stuff. Highly encourage you guys to check them out. Excellent platform for virtual tabletop gaming, and we're very grateful to them for their support of the stream. Uh, next up, Twy. I believe you had some things you wanted to go yes. through. Yes. So our, we, are, we are very thankful for our varied and continually growing Twitch audience. We are really appreciative. And we wanted to let you know that, well, first off, again, thank you. God bless y'all. And second, that we have some brand new emotes, courtesy of Jack. We ha now have a nat 20 and a nat 1 emote, which are beautiful and lovely, and all you have to do is subscribe. Which you can do with Amazon Prime, if you've got it. And those are, yeah, and... At the, remember, at the moment, all of that money goes back to the stream and back to us. And thank you. Thank you for showing them off so fantastically. So if that ever changes, we will let you know. But at the moment, this everything we get is put back into making this the best stream and the best experience that it can be. Thank you. And Perfect. next up, mm -hmm. S Serena. I uh, just wanted to say real quick uh, before that, uh, thank you to everyone who's supported. Uh, we're going to, you know... Do what we can to use these resources for you know assets and different things that the stream can use um looking to make sure you know like uh twice said that it's the best that it can be for you guys uh so yes uh sorry serena don't worry about it um so as i said earlier we want to hear from you if you have some time to fill out our audience survey you can do so at tinyurl.com slash twice bitten poll um and again thank you to everyone who's filled it out so far the feedback is super appreciated as always, you can submit art, ads, and memes to our email, uh, twicebittencos at gmail.com. Make sure to submit everything you send either on Discord or on Twitter to that email as well, because that's how I keep track of everything. Um, and just a reminder that we do have a Deadpool. Um, it is open um, post-game from Saturday until 12.59 uh, p.m. the following Saturday. Um, so I will put, drop that link in the chat as well for you guys to fill that out when we're not actively in session. Um, the winners will get a special shout out and hopefully some other fun stuff down the line. Thank you, Serena. And yes, definitely a big thank you to everyone who has given us feedback uh, or has uh, given us a shout out or followed us on Twitter. So thank you all for sticking around during the break and for these announcements. Uh, without uh, any further ado, I think we're ready to get started. So let's dive right back in to Twice Bitten. And so, as you make your way southwest, away from the village of Barovia, as the silhouettes of the old houses fade into the mists, Lois and you for a moment catch the Silhouette of a woman, a flash of the same blue-green color you've seen from the alleyway, staring at you from the edge of the village as you make your way away, and then slowly receding into the alleyway, vanishing from sight. All right. I think it may be safe now to drop the spell, but if we wish to be cautious, um, we may as well keep it up as long as possible. I'm fine with that. It's not too much mental strain. As long as, Irina, you're not about to fall into a mud puddle or something. You hear a muffled voice from thin air say, Not the problem. I think I'm doing pretty well so far. And you actually thought that you had uh, known where she was, and then her voice comes like from five feet to the right of that, so it almost startles you a little bit. Ah! She oh. rolled a 20 on her stealth check. Nice. Goodness gracious! I God, she's oh. perfect. All right, yeah, no, you're getting the hang of it quite well. Lillison looks over at Kiva and just smirks a little bit. That wasn't said out loud, but I appreciate the <laughs> smirk. All right, unless there's anything else you wish to do, as Mark uh, turns and begins making his way down the road once more. Yeah. Are you all following? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. You continue on your path, uh, making your way away from the village. You pass through uh, waving fields of uh, grayish green grass, 
scattered in places. You can occasionally see old, uh, uh, old uh, dead trees growing out of the landscape, but the any bit of foliage beyond the grass in this part of the valley seems scarce. You can see the great edge of the Svalish woods rising up over the edges of the valley on the opposite side of the river, and as you grow steadily closer to the uh, river's edge, you can see on your left-hand side of the road a, a new site. You stumble upon an old grave, a headstone rising slightly out of the earth, almost concealed by the rotted yellowish gray grass around it. And as you pass by, you can see with a bit of a shudder down your spine that the grave itself is little more beneath the headstone than a shallow mud-filled hole strewn with dirt and rocks. You hear, you see a Ismark shudder faintly. The grave has clearly been violated. Erthrandir has a terrible thought. Does he see footprints around the grave at all? Make a survival check. Oh, boy. Ranger. Eleven. Glancing around, you don't notice any footprints as such. It seems to be... Uh, to have been desecrated or uncovered quite a while ago. There's nothing more than a few scattered bone within. Does the okay. headstone have a name? The headstone's name is too faded and cracked to make out. You can see that at one point it had something there, but it's been weathered into illegibility by the passing of decades, if not longer. Poor sod. Not sure why you'd bury this far in the woods, though, unless there used to be a cabin out here. Or unless they were not permitted to be buried in the graveyard for whatever reason. Excellent point. I... Regardless. He kind of bows his head. May he find rest in peace. He's going to continue on. Trying to lighten the mood, Amity says, Never have I ever seen a real-life dragon. What? What? <laughs> oh, it's... <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's a game? Oh. oh. How do you play? Oh, um, it's... So, uh, everyone says something that they've never done, and then you're supposed to, like, clap if you've done it. Oh. I think I've heard this game, but instead of clapping, and instead of clapping, you you take a shot. Hmm. Oh, I have heard of a similar game, except um, instead of clapping or drinking, you remove a piece of clothing. <laughs> yeah, I've I've, no. I've heard it done that way too, but I don't know if that would be appropriate right now. No, certainly not. I want to play games where y'all are playing them. We just put down fingers. I didn't. I didn't ever play these games before, but Lilith and I'm. I'm curious about your rule set. That sounds quite fun. I mean, certainly not while we're traveling. And, um, I mean, it sounded. Uh, it, 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 it's not as if I ever played it myself or were permitted to. No, of course not. I'm not meaning to imply anything like that. Ain't our business. Yeah, he was no. sort of giving her a little, like, up and down smirk, a <laughs> little teasingly. But yeah, no, that does sound fun, Amity. Uh, what, what exactly do you define as a real-life dragon? Um, I, I feel like you're saying that because you've seen something that's like an edge case, but I, I honestly have no idea. Um, <laughs> maybe just say what you've seen? No, I mean, the, the fact that you said real life makes me think, are you... What set of dragons are you excluding? No, I'm just excluding, like, costumes and pictures and stuff. I mean, like, actual dragons. You, oh. Like. oh, all right. Uh, never have I ever seen a mountain. What? What? Look, they're they're not like everywhere, you know. 
I mean, we've all seen them, seen them here. So I, I think, do we all, do we all clap or do the finger down thing? What are we? I'll, I'm gonna take a drink. And then <laughs> uh, takes a bit of a swig from count? his wine skin. That, that was just a big hill. Aren't mountains supposed to have like mist and snowy peaks and? There's tons of mist oh. around here. Hey, you know what I mean. They're supposed to be sharp, not these weird, like, rounded things. That's just a big hill. Is the one that that castle was on not a mountain? I... Huh. Honestly, I'd call that, like, a... Plateau? As All thrilling right. as this uh, <laughs> conversation about mountains is, is we should perhaps keep eyes on the road. We can, we can keep eyes on the road and talk about plateaus. <laughs> As he's, enough, you, you see is more kind of like idly scanning the landscape and as he does he just kind of like idly murmurs well if you've not seen a true mountain before i'm sure you might see one should you uh stumble upon Mount Beratok. oh it's oh, so in the northern here? part of the valley oh wonderful i what's it like or i guess or is it I, like i have not been there myself um i have heard from travelers that it is uh Quite a sight. It extends for quite a ways alongside the uh, northern part of Wallachie. Uh, but perhaps it might not be best to uh, approach too close. I've heard of a, a certain creature that uh, occupies its foothills. Well, you can't what just... What manner like... of creature is that? Yeah. From what I have heard, it is a man, but uh, more than a man. A wizard. A powerful one. And quite absolutely mad. Oh, lovely. Just, does he just live up there? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I know that he did not come from there. From what I've heard, he's an outsider of sorts. But beyond that, I do not think I wish to meet him very much. Yeah, no, seconded, thirded, and fourth. This land really has everything. Vampires, mad mages, mists. What next? Lillison's gaze actually sharpens quite a bit, and she says, Is this simply a legend, or is this uh, very much a confirmed thing? I have, uh, well, I have heard it uh, told by uh, uh, one of the uh, folk that delivers uh, the uh, vine from uh, across the valley. So um, it might just be a uh, gossip or a... Uh, wife's tale, but um, I had, from what I have heard, um, it may have been quite recent. It does not, I did not grow up with it. I heard it uh, quite recently, in fact. Only a few uh, months ago. Do you think perhaps the people in Velaki who live closer to this mountain might have better news of this? That could be possible, I suppose. Ever, have you ever met a very powerful wizard? Earth and Deer puts I mean, his finger down. Me, so. <laughs> oh, Lillison raises her hands as if she's about to clap and then shrugs and drops her hands again. Just to be clear, clapping means that we have not seen this thing? Uh, that, that you have. Oh. Oh, oh, oh I got I, confused. I, do, I don't need to clap then. And he, I do. He doesn't clap. And Lillison... Kinda does, but she's feeling a little bashful about it, so we'll leave her be. I was, um, on my way, to, but I suppose that intentions don't really count. Hell yeah, they do. Well, who are you meeting? I don't know. Um, not in particular, anyway. I had a letter of introduction for somebody in Neverwinter. Oh, interesting. What were you going to talk to him about? Various things. Um, and then she gives a little apologetic half smile and she looks at everybody else and kind of strokes her chin a little bit and starts smirking and says, Never have I ever kissed anybody. Oh. How many claps? So to be clear, if we do or we don't, or... or Ah, right. Earth and Deer claps. I had a kid, so it's pretty obvious. I'm a virgin, so... <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off! <laughs> oh, like hell. And uh, Metron takes a pretty big gulp of his wine uh, wineskin. 
sure yeah. Or I suppose it's none of my business. I think he just wanted to drink. Fair. Uh, Metron winks. <laughs> <laughs> but really? Not ever? Not even like his kids or something? No, I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm talking to Lillison. Oh, well. No. Just never never happened. Never was a reason. Ah, fair enough. And like we're not counting just like kissing your parents goodnight or whatever. Of course not. Yeah, no, that's entirely fair. Never have I ever killed someone. Lillison raises her hands and claps. Kiva claps as well. Metreon, way to bring that up. Oh. It's fine, Apologies, love. I, I just, I uh, apologize. I slipped my mind. Uh, Don't worry about it. We're playing a game. It's really fine. Yeah. Uh, Mark coughs. Yeah. Wolves don't count, right? They're not people. Fair enough. I, well, I'd say a wolf counts. How big was the wolf? Uh, it was... I think I came up to its shoulder. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, I'd say that counts then. Wait, you came up to its shoulder. That's what I yes, heard. Yes, and he claps. What? They get that? Are you sure there was a wolf and not like a grizzly bear? It was a dire wolf. You will have to keep an eye out for them. There are some packs in the, wo in the they, woods. They Dire seem hard wolf. to miss. <laughs> yes, precisely. Does Erythrodeer know anything about those? Make a nature check. Kiva wants Ooh. nothing to know about those. Nat 20, 24. Yeah! Right. You are quite familiar uh, with Dire Wolves. Uh, you've actually seen once or one or two uh, yourself uh, passing through your uh, territories that you've previously uh, experienced or uh, traveled through. You know them to be uh, much larger uh, cousins, ancestors of a kind of uh, ordinary wolves. They are of a much uh, older species. They are, in some cases, their fur can be much darker colors. Um, some of them even have uh, strange bits of bone growing out of their hides and uh, twisted or uh, multiple places. They can be far more aggressive than normal wolves, far more bloodthirsty, and owing with their size, eat quite a bit more. They're around the size of a horse on average, and they are incredibly feral creatures. Erythrindir looks at this and kind of mutters, Hey, uh, if we're going to keep playing this game, why don't we move to a quieter noise, please? Much, much quieter. Perhaps we can just raise our hands or something. That works too, just a- Although, I suppose then we can't see Irina. <laughs> ah, right, hold on. And Erythrindir lifts the spell. Irina abruptly appears uh, slightly to uh, Kiva's left. Oh, that was- she looks down her hands. All right, I can I can see myself again. Yeah. You have a good time? She nods. Uh, well, it was a bit strange, but she glances back over her shoulder. It looks like it did the trick, I suppose. There wasn't any searing pain, was there? No. It didn't hurt at all. It just felt like... Well, like I, I was looking at the world through a, a, a veil of mist. Oh. Huh. Very apt description. And glad it didn't hurt. That's very good. Can we backtrace to the fact that Lillison clapped on the have you ever killed someone? Oh, I didn't miss that, yes. I just didn't want to bring it up. I'm not one to talk, so... <sighs> Lillison raises an eyebrow and shrugs. It's a very casual reaction to that. I mean, I feel like that's straight in the middle of none of our business territory. Well, if we're going to be traveling together, and perhaps uh, for a, a good stretch of time, I mean, we should probably know some more things about each other, shouldn't we? 
Reasonable enough, I guess. We should know who we're bunking with. <laughs> Somebody who steals all the damn pillows. Uh, I didn't steal them, I used them. Yes, and you stopped me from using them. That all is right. death. Uh, never have I ever gotten a tattoo. <sighs> Erthrandir raises a single tentative hand. Now, Wait, you, where would that you be? what? It was 45 years ago. I was young. I was angry, and I was very stupid. What's it of? Is it a tramp stamp? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, it is not. It's a... It's a... It's not anything complicated. Just a bit of verse. Uh, Show my, us. Show us. Erthrandir sighs and pulls up his shirt, and you can see along his back, along his back, there's a bit of flowing script and elvish, maybe a line or two, beautiful and obviously expertly done, at least by Matrion's eye, and then quickly lowers his shirt down again. There, done. Well, uh, done work. Lillison leans in to see if she can read any of it before he flips his shirt down. Hmm. Would this be a contested check or? Uh, I would say make a slate of hand check contested by Lillison's perception. And if uh, Kiva would like to try to read it as well, you can also roll perception. Oh, I would love that. That's oh, an boy. eighteen perception. That's a God. twenty perception. That's, that's a sixteen slide of hand. All right. So if you wouldn't mind telling the two ladies what your he'll uh, be cotton tattoo reads. <laughs> He saw it. Okay. It says... Never forget those we've lost. A bit more formally than that. Very flowy, but that's the common translation. Or more... A, a better, like, translation of the... Kind of intent would be... Keep those departed in your heart. Well, that's As lovely. A... And not embarrassing at all. Yes, it is. It's, it's stupid. It's it, it, like, I was, oh, get your Cree tattooed on your back. That sure won't. It, it's, it's, it's part of me. I'll probably get rid of it at some point, but I have not had the money. I mean, you've got nothing but time. Kiva, what did it say? Uh, it said something like, uh, keep those departed in your heart, I believe he said was the translation. Can we move on now? Sure, it's your question anyway, it seems like. Oh, it's at this point you realize that you've arrived at an arching stone bridge spanning the clear blue river that crosses the edge of the valley before you. Ismark just gives a nod and continues forward, crossing over the stone bridge. Oh, wow, look, a distraction. Oh, that's beautiful. There aren't going to be any trolls under this, Ismark, are there? I, I, I don't know if my stomach can take anything like that. I certainly hope not. I cannot say I've ever met a troll. So I will, uh, you will have to tell me if we find one. Yes, uh, we'll do. With that, you continue forward. Do you, is there anything else you guys like would like to uh, continue speaking about as you make your way forward? No, I, 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 maybe just like some small talk here and there, but nothing important yeah. on Metrion's end. Probably. Yeah, if Ethern Deer doesn't have a question, then no. He, he kind of appear, appears to desperately want to move the conversation somewhere else. So. <laughs> After some amount of time, uh, Lillison is going to say, By the way, um, I do believe that our ruse worked quite well. I saw somebody watching us and then watching the house. Uh, somebody dressed in bright blue and green. 
Oh, another one of those Vistani, then? I don't know for certain, but... It if seems... they were wearing such uh, colors, it is very likely that you did see a, a Vistani. I am concerned that they are watching, but not entirely surprised. Well, if they are, then we've got a significant lead on them. Um, and they can and they presumably can't travel at night either, so we can maybe keep that. After, Speaking of what? Oh, sorry, go on. After another moment, uh, Lillison adds with a smirk creeping across her lips, I feel rather proud of that little bit of trickery. And to think that all of you watched that and then believed me just because I clapped my hands. You motherfucker! <laughs> I we were bearing our hearts. I showed you. I I showed you idiots the. You bared your back, not your heart. Yes, that is about the same. I was just excited to have someone else in the kill someone club. Um, I don't even believe you now. I think you were telling the truth, and now you're trying to get out of it. Yeah, I don't put anything. I don't put anything past you. Her smirk just grows wider and wider. Yeah, see there? That, that, that's, she's that's trying what to I'm trick talking us. about. I, next thing we're going to find out, she's actually like a Goliath. Just a very small one. She's been doing a better job than Metreon of hiding her pigment. Anything goes. Ah. <sighs> Man. Uh, DM, I was going to ask, too, speaking of watching, uh, Metreon does kind of glance back occasionally. Has he seen any more bats? Make a perception check. Eight. You've not seen any bats since uh, the swarm departed that morning. Although, as you continue forward, uh, making your way through and... Uh, over the bridge, you hear the softly rushing river slowly fade behind you as you cross over the edge and continue making your way forward. Soon you see the road swallowed up by trees on either side, the familiar darkness and murk of the Svalich wood coming up around you. You continue forward as the road slowly bends around the side, another quarter hour passing. As you follow it through the minutes, at one point it emerges adjacent as the trees clear and you can see a, a river, perhaps the same one, flowing clear but gray through the edge of the trees, flowing forth and vanishing into the mists to the northwest. The path veers away from it, continuing along the lower part of the valley, and up before you can see the edge of the valley, a outcropping of mountainous terrain rising up, towering over the edge of the base of the terrain here. And before long, you come to a place where the trees open up into a clearing, and you can see a fork in the road. Well, that's Here, not ominous at all. You can see an old wooden gallows that creaks in a chill wind that blows down from the high ground to the west. A frayed length of rope dances from its beam. The well-worn road splits here, and a signpost opposite the gallows points off in three directions. Barovia Village to the east, Sare Pool to the northwest, and Ravenloft slash Velaki to the southwest. The northwest fork slants down and disappears into the trees, while the southwest fork clings to an upward slope. Across from the gallows, a low wall, crumbling in places, partially encloses a small plot of graves shrouded in fog. Let's keep on then, yes. Gladly. Uh, Ismark, what is Sarpool? I... 
have not visited it myself. From what I know, it is a body of water somewhere to the west of uh, Barovia. I've not gone there myself, so I don't know much about it. Huh. Interesting. It's like a little lake, then? As what? far as I know. From what I have heard, the uh, uh, river Evelis might connect with it at some point, but uh, like I said, I have not uh, come uh, far this way before. Makes sense. If there are dire wolves in these woods, I wouldn't want to be out here either. Whew. But yeah, so, let's... on to Velak uh, Velaki then. Yep. Er... I should think so. Although, I do have a question. Was there civilization out here? I mean, the gallows would seem to imply, and the graveyard would... Were there villages that used to be around? That I do not know. Whoever built these gallows and these graves, I have cannot say that I have ever heard or met anyone who knew of them. I just know that they have been here for quite a long time. Freaking human lifespans. I gotcha. He's going to for a moment walk over to the graveyard and see if he can if any of the names are legible. You make your way over and you see to your dismay that all of the gravestones are blank. Like blank blank or worn away? Entirely blank. They appear to have never been inscribed with any sort of writing. Oh, that's not good. He Why is backs that up slowly. Good? Because that means one of two things. Either they buried someone and wanted to be sure they didn't dig them up later, but didn't think they were worthy of being named, or they intended to bury a lot of people and something happened to them in between. What's the? I mean, maybe they're just papa's graves. You know, uh, they want they they wanted something to demarcate the land, but didn't have the gold to inscribe a personalized tombstone. Popper popper's graves have like rocks a tombstone of like actual quality but no name on it that's different perhaps the stone cutter was the first one who died that would be ironic that would <laughs> there's a there's a noose over there so maybe there are criminals that they didn't want to name no that yeah no you you and metrion are right that's a probably it it's nothing to be afraid of Sorry, I just get antsy around this sort of thing. Just like, you know, the Yes, you seem very tense. Are you implying something? No. It's just something I've observed since we've been traveling together. Are you offering to do something about it, Matreon? Uh and he kind of uh shakes a half empty wineskin. Uh, until then, I'm down. On that note, we should keep moving. As uh, Erthendir moves past Metron, he takes a quick sip of the wineskin and puts it back in his jacket. Arena. Yes. How are you holding up? As well as I can be, I suppose. Um. She kind of pulls her cloak a little bit tighter around her shoulders. Uh, the sooner we get in uh, uh, Velaki, I'm sure the happier we'll all be. Um, but I'm doing all right. Uh, why do you ask? Is something wrong? No, you've just been quiet, and I, I know that you've been cooped up. You're just showing uh, concern, I suppose. Did you want a nip? Oh, um... Are you offering her uh, a sip? Yeah, of wine? he's he's kind of like pulling out the 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 spigot of the uh, of the wine skin out of his jacket and showing it to her. She regards it for a second, and then nods and gratefully uh, accepts the wine skin. She uh, tosses it back for a quick quick gulp, then wipes her mouth and hands it back. You can see there's a bit of color uh, in her cheeks. Thank you. That was um, I needed that. Just a little bit of courage. It's not even courage, it's strange. It's just a bit of a weird feeling I've been having. What do you mean? 
it um just kind of looks at ismark looking a, a bit uh conflicted it's just something that's been gnawing at me i guess uh since we passed over the bridge uh as as far as i remember i've never been too far out of the village but the road has felt very familiar for some reason and i'm not sure why i almost expected uh uh the gallows before we saw them if that makes sense uh i've heard of something like that i think it was called deja vu but i i mean if you've never been out of the city out of barovia it doesn't make much sense i wouldn't think about it too much though maybe you heard a story about it or something kind of absorbed it dreamt about it i don't know yes that's that's probably correct that's probably I, i'm sure i'm sure i heard Ismark talking about it after he uh went hunting or something she nods he uh he smiles at her uh again the the fangs still kind of showing uh but uh he'll turn back towards the road and uh keep walking All right, with that, the group of you begins making your way, uh, branching off toward the Velaki Raven Loft branch of the fork in the road. You continue making your way through the low hanging mist, leaving the evergreen trees and uh, dead uh, boughs and gnarled branches cutting through the air behind you. And as you pass away from the gallows and the cemetery, you hear a creaking noise behind you, coming from the gallows. Turning what around where there was nothing before. You can see now hangs a lifeless gray body. Wilson's head whips around and she stops. Kiva's got her scimitar drawn as soon as she notices it. Yeah, Metreon's kind of pulling the hand crossbow halfway out of his jacket. Long bow strung. The body doesn't move, but the breeze turns the hanged figure slowly so that it can fix its dead eyes upon you. All of you see uh, just a pale skinned uh, individual, uh, an unfamiliar man of uh, a shock of black hair thinning in some places. Um, holding, wearing you know, drab, faded clothing. But Lillison, you don't see this Barovian. Instead, as you look upon the figure hanging there, from the slightly pointed ears to the long black hair over the shoulders, the dark green tunic, you see yourself hanging the noose around the neck, dangling slightly as she sways from side to side. Um, not blinking at all. Not looking to either side. Lillison just starts walking back towards the gallows. Lillison, oh, what, are you do what are you doing? I have to make certain of something. Kiva's, what did it... like, right behind her with the scimitar still. What do you need to make certain of? It's, 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 it's a body. It's probably just something that's, uh, it's something that's fucking with us. Let's, let's go. Come on. She puts her boot on the first um, step up to the gallows platform and tests her weight a little bit. Um, does it seem sturdy enough to step on? The platform seems to be mostly begun to rot. Uh, it's around five feet off the ground, and the wooden stairs leading up to the platform are not in great shape, but you think that they'll probably hold your weight. It's not likely to collapse. Lillison, that thing could be undead. You please don't get close to it. It's all right. She no, will step right. up to the platform and then uh, reach up and how high up is this body dangling? It's not overly high up. It's perhaps maybe, you know, a foot or two, uh, the feet are maybe a foot or two off the ground. Okay. 
Um, she's going to reach up, then think better of it, uh, quickly summon her mage hand, and then uh, have the index finger of the skeletal hand just trace down the cheek of the body that she sees that seems to be her own very gently. The skeletal mage hand slightly touches upon the cheek and begins to drag across in a gentle line. And in its wake, as in each place where it's touched the flesh of the corpse, you watch as it rapidly begins, The you watch as the corpse from the point of contact rapidly begins to liquefy, turning a dark brown and a deep rotted black. You, the rest of you watch as this unfamiliar Barovian begins to rot from the point of contact, then from the inside out, slowly spilling into a dark black sludge that falls to the ground and then dissipates, evaporating into dark mist as it hits the platform. Kiva looks like she's gonna be hangs sick. hangs emptily. <sighs> I see. So we all get down from there, please. Not looking at anybody, uh, Lillison will kind of scrape her boots um, against the edge of the platform, almost woodenly, to get a bit of the sludge off, and then uh, not looking at anybody again, hop off and keep her gaze fixed on the ground as she rejoins the others. Let's get out of here, quickly. Amity is already like 20 feet ahead of the rest of them, um, probably. <laughs> What were you testing? Whether it was real or an illusion like those um, hooded figures back in the basement where our hands passed right through them. And? Well, since it didn't behave in the same way, I would say that it doesn't seem to be exactly the same phenomenon. So that wasn't a, an illusory putrefaction, that was a, just a real putrefaction that we saw. It still wasn't real, really. If you saw the way that it all evaporated, it was... I don't claim to understand it, but at least we can be reasonably certain it isn't the same presence as back there? Yeah, no, if that thing came shambling out of the woods, I was going to have a heart attack. That being said, I, I'm starting to think that, nah, never mind. We can ponder that when we get to Valakai. Yes. Keep moving. Also, putrefaction. Good word. Excellent word. And yeah, he'll keep moving. All right, with a final shudder, Ismark and Irina turn and join you, making their way alongside you back into the road ahead. You pass forward, leaving the edge of the trees behind as the road begins to scale the edge of a large hilly rise overlooking the edge of the valley. The road climbs for a bit of a time as you pass through the occasional dead bush and foliage. The mist is thick here, bits of fog wrapping around the edges of the cliff face and Soon enough, you're almost grateful to be back again once more in the woods as the path winds down from this altitude and begins descending through the trees, away from the mountainous silhouette to the southwest. You pass around a bend, the edge of the trees here clinging in tight like long skeletal fingers, their dead boughs scraping and reaching through the air toward you as the mist lazily wanders across the ground. The mud glistens and seeps in long puddles across the dirt, and as your boots splash through it, you can see your face is reflected, though distorted and 
darkened. Lillison, as you pass across one muddy puddle, you think you see your features similar to the ones you saw upon the new sunken and skeletal and bloated, and then you step into the puddle and the illusion vanishes. You continue forward until you come to a point where the road continues around a bend in the very switchback edge of the winding mountainous ridge. And as you do, you hear a rustling in the underbrush to the right-hand side. Kiva, as you glance off to your right over your shoulder, you can faintly see a pair of glinting yellow-amber eyes leering at you from the low foliage of the darkness. Is it just the eyes that she's seeing, or does it look like they're attached to a large creature of some kind? Uh, make a perception check. That is a 15. Glancing over it, you can see they appear to be fairly low to the ground, perhaps no more than uh, two or three feet from the earth. But you could just barely make out the silhouette of a uh, crouching canine body that you can see lupine ears flicking faintly from the dark shadows behind the uh, brambled withered brush. And you see the distinct silhouette of a wolf, the owner of the eyes, silently watching you from the darkness. Kiva, um both like sticks closer to Irina, but also pushes them up a little bit closer to Ismark um, and whispers to Ismark that we have some company. Um, over to the right, it looks like at least one wolf. Ismark, was that a muttered curse? Damn it. What do you think? It could be one of his, do you think it's worth taking on? Part of me thinks that we don't engage until we're engaged. Doesn't seem sense into getting into a fight without reason. I say we keep on, but we keep an eye around us and be prepared for a fight. And as she says that, she sort of um, slowly unsheaths her scimitar and holds it so it's hanging, sort of um, resting against her thigh, but it's in her hand, ready to be drawn. Seeing Kiva start to draw her weapon, Metreon uh, will instinctively start to draw out his hand crossbow. What is it? What would you see? Kiva makes a hand signal, um, pointing off to the right. Yeah, uh, Metreon will back away a bit, uh, but he'll draw his crossbow in full now. Do... Do the rest of us notice this, or are we too far ahead? The rest of you do notice this, yes. You can see the lupine shape of the wolf in the foliage with Kiva's gaze pointed at it. Oh, Spark. Boy. You said that the wolves also serve him? He nods, or, well, or worse. Great. So the question is, do we confront it now, or do we hope they don't harass us and give them time, give time for the entire pack to get here? I don't think it's wise to engage right now. They're just watching us. All right. And, but all of us should be ready in yep. case something does come out. Just They're know watching, that- watching, but that means they see and she inclines her head toward Irina. They don't know she's her, necessarily. Matreon did it. I mean, keep your... Erethrindir's going to slip into Elvish. Keep your voice down. Ah, yes. I had forgotten. Kiva also in Elvish says, Look, as long as we just keep moving and keep her in the middle, it shouldn't be an issue. But we should be ready for some sort of combat. I can't imagine any creature in these woods would not want to do us harm. Metreon, Metreon leads into Amity. Do you know what the fuck they're saying? No, I don't know 
is it? It's like elfish, I think. Sneaky. Right. Shall we continue then? Back in yes. common. Yeah, of course. Erythrin Deer palming his wand, his wand from his pocket into his hand. Let's. Still watching the wolf uneasily as Mark keeps his hand at the hilt at his side, but nods and continues following your lead. You continue making your way forward as the trail continues to descend the side of the switchback ridge. And as you do, you notice and hear the sound of soft paw pads following you through the underbrush. The amber eyes of the wolf slowly following you from a good few feet back as it prowls to the darkness. Eventually, however, you come to a point where the forest reaches its end and the road emerges into a clearing once more at the very base of a larger mountain that vanishes up into the overcast clouds ahead, up ahead. And the wolf watches you for a moment and then vanishes into the trees. Oh, thank Corellian. We don't know that we're out of the woods yet, um, metaphorically I mean, speaking, of course, and uh, we should just be wary at least until we get to uh, Balaki. I, ever since I stepped foot in here, wary is not really a setting that turns off. But yes, point taken. Once the wolf departs, though, um, Kiva will step closer to Irina and just ask if she's all right. Irina looks up at you. Oh, um, I think so. Um, I, I'm sorry. It's just, it's, I really, it's just that I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm suddenly very grateful to, uh, uh Master Metrion for, uh, for the, uh, haircut and everything. Um. I don't think I'd like to be out here without it. It was definitely a smart idea. And she sort of um, gives her arm like a comforting squeeze and then um, lets go and puts a little bit more distance. Not a ton, but a little bit more. You are already taking a brief shuddering breath as she kind of smooths down her cloak, kind of touches the rapier at her side as if to reassure herself, and then <sighs> exhales. And turns back to you and begins making your way forward following the group. Uh, Izzy, uh, I'm, may I call you Izzy? As Mark like doesn't respond and then like five seconds pass and he's like, oh, w wait, what What are you? Yes, I'm sorry, is Mark. I was oh, I, I didn't, I, um, it, it is an odd name. Um, I suppose I would prefer it doesn't matter. Uh, what, what is yeah, it? Is Mark? It's fine. Uh, how much longer do we get to Valakai from here? Frowns and glances up at the sky. It's difficult to tell. You've noticed since entering that you have not uh, been able to catch a glimpse of the sun to measure time. It is still quite uh, bright out. Um, I should hope that we are perhaps will. We've not been on the road for a very long time. Uh, perhaps another few hours. By this point, you estimate it's maybe been an hour and a half since leaving. Metreon takes a deep sigh and uh, still with his hand crossbow at his side uh, continues to walk with the others. Kind of like flanking, uh, flanking Irina with Kiva. You continue on your way forward, now following the road as it passes alongside the outer edge of the woods. You can see the great silhouette of the mountain to the southwest towering above you as the mists wisp and whirl around the edges of its ridge. Up ahead, you can see an outcropping of one of those ridges obstructing the way forward as the path wends and winds its way around it. The path continues descending to a lower portion of the valley, Another hour, then an hour and a half passing before you see something new coming into view. 
you follow the dirt road as it clings to the side of the mountain and ends before an arching bridge of mold encrusted stone that spans a natural chasm. Gargoyles cloaked in black moss perch on the corners of the bridge, their frowns weather worn. On the mountainous side of the bridge, a waterfall spills into a misty pool nearly a thousand feet below. The pool feeds a river that meanders into the fog shrouded pines that blanket the valley. Deer steps up to the bridge and just rests his arms on it, just staring. It's beautiful. You never seen a waterfall before? I, I, I have, but just flanked by the trees with the tree line up top and the fog all around. Looks like a painting. I'm sure there's art in Valaki, uh, Valaki that we can go look at, so just come on. Two minutes, please. I just, I want to remember this. Kiva keeps moving on, and, uh, but, you know, sort of shoots a glance back at Erythrindir, trying to be like, hurry up. <sighs> Fine. Amity's going to toss a rock as far as she can uh, out the waterfall and just watch it fall, but then continue. <laughs> Earth and watch as Irina's eyes kind of drift over the surface of the waterfall, a kind of faraway look in her eyes for a moment, and then she shakes her head and joins the others, a small smile on her face. Earth and Deer will reluctantly stand and follow them. You continue forward, leaving the falls behind. You pass over the bridge, the leering faces of the gargoyles watching you as you go. And then cross over the bridge onto the opposite side once more into the mist-filled ridges that fill the corners and edges of the valley. You pass forward following the trail for another 10, 15 minutes. The road pulls back, winding its way southward and then pulling around on the opposite side. It wanders north for another little while. You see the occasional uh, old gnarled tree sticking up out of the landscape though as the mountains pull away from the road it's almost clear a landscape aside from the mountainous ridges that glare over you from the space above on either side even here it feels in the mountains the forest and the fog are inescapable ahead the dirt road splits in two widening toward the east. There you see patches of cobblestone suggesting that the eastern branch was once an important thoroughfare. Is Marcus Off to the fork the... in the road, pointed east, is a large black carriage drawn by two black horses. The horses snort puffs of steamy breath into the chill mountain air. The side door of the carriage swings open silently. And out steps a man. He is tall, gaunt, and dressed in finery, befitting a man of aristocratic, even royal stature. A black cloak is pulled neatly up around his shoulders, tied at the neck by a blood red brooch. His scarlet tunic is worked with intricate designs, and his hair is pulled back into a sharp and immaculate widow's peak. His eyes are dark, and as he moves to adjust the ruby at his neck, you see that his fingernails form long, elegant claws. It's only then that you realize that his skin is pale, unnaturally so, and that his eyes glint with a deep, intelligent hunger. Ismark steps forward, one hand on his sword, and Irina gasps. 
no, but it, it's daytime. It, it shouldn't be. Is Mark oh. glances toward her. We should run. Well, what, what, what is it? The man instantly fixes his eyes upon Ismark. His slightly pointed ears you can see pricking up at the sound of his voice from more than a dozen yards away. Master Kolyanovich, would you truly deprive me of your presence so swiftly? From behind him you hear a chorus of low feral growls, and from the underbrush behind him glint six pairs of eyes. Rather than low to the ground, each one is at the height of a man's shoulder. Slowly, from the shadows, slink six massive wolves, each one as tall as a horse, easily nine feet in length and twice as muscled. Their fur is a thick, mottled gray, and saliva drips from their yellowed, sharpened teeth, splatting on the ground where it hisses with heat. They take a position behind and around the man, flanking him like a noble's honor guard. When the man's gaze meets Ismark, Ismark draws his sword a half inch from its scabbard, and the man's eyes widen, his nostrils flaring like a bat's. His eyes briefly come to rest on Irina, and she stiffens, and the man smiles, though there's no warmth in it. Lady Koliana. He gives her a deep nod, nearly a shallow bow, that there's something almost mocking to the motion. He then turns his gaze to you. Good day. I am Count Strahd von Zarevich, and it is a pleasure to meet you at last. My friends have told me so much about you. Run. Time they, to go, time to go. They have fucking horses. We're not making it anywhere. Uh, Metreon is, is like backing away and he's starting to, he's starting to hoof it. Kiva has put herself in between um, Strahd and Irina and is like backing her further away from, from Strahd as she can go, but following Metreon. Yeah, yeah Metreon actually sees this and starts to take Irina's hand and starts to lead her away. Erythrindir shoots a desperate look to Amity and to Amity and Millicent and then gives a desperate deep bow. A pleasure to meet you, Lord Von Zarevich, I presume. You hear the wolves growl, their hackles raising, as they see Metron and Kiva beginning to pull away. Zarevich holds up a hand, and the wolves growl silence, so their hackles remain raised, their eyes fixated on Kiva and Metreon. You would be correct. I should hope that the Burgomaster's children have properly introduced you to my domain, though I do apologize for any folk tales they may have shared about me. His eyes pauses on, on you, and for a moment you feel like a small animal weighed at market, a prey animal spotted by a predator in the bush. You feel like almost an intriguing but inanimate trinket as a sense of dawning terror and overwhelming presence sweeps over you. And then he blinks, and you can feel like you can breathe once more. Welcome to Barovia. If I'm not mistaken, you must be Erthrandir, are you not? That is my name. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, unexpected as it is. I, and a uh, pleasure to make yours. Yes, Kiva? Kiva's shooting daggers at Erthrandir with her eyes. She's just so fucking pissed right now. Same with Metreon. He uh, fixes uh, his gaze to yours, looking deep into your eyes. It's truly been such a long while since I've enjoyed new elves in my lands. It is a pleasure to have you. And uh, Erythrindir, if you don't mind, uh, on Foundry. Yes? On the bottom of your chat box, do you mind setting it from public role to private GM role? I can. And I will need you to make a wisdom saving throw, please. I can do that. Come on, high rolls. The real important question, though, is how is Truffle right now? This is um, true. <laughs> Truffle is uh, cowering uh, among Amity's uh, tail and uh, good leg as Amity calls out, um, Lord, I'm I'm not here to, to stop you or, or to protect anyone. Um, so just do, do what you want and I won't get in the way. And Amity, Amity uh, takes a few steps backwards. What are you doing? 
Amity is not even going to look at Kiva. This mark immediately, his his uh, hand latches forward onto uh, Erthrandir's shoulder and tries to pull him back. Don't look into his eyes. We need to run. You see, Irina is visibly pale and averting her gaze. Is Mark very studiously not looking directly at Zarevich? Look, running isn't going to get us anywhere. He's got horses, he's got wolves that can outpace us. And if he wanted us dead, we'd be dead. We accomplish nothing by running except by making our deaths messy. Let's just stay and talk, please. <laughs> What the fuck is your problem, man? This, this is a we fucking have devil. We nothing to say. Wilson has been standing, like, stock still, just trembling this entire time. But as the others um, are speaking amongst themselves, she is going to... Her spine stiffens a bit, and she walks forward, her eyes near the ground, and she executes um, a, you know, perfect... Um, like, half curtsy in pants half bow um just like a, a perfect court gesture and says you do us all too much honor by coming to meet us personally you watch as his eyebrows rise in his forehead and his mouth widens into a smile impressive one who knows proper manners Lillison, is it not? I've heard much about your lateral thinking and calculated courage. I admire strong wills. You may rise. She uh, rises, but, you know, keeping her eyes basically on his shoes and says, I am honored that my humble deeds have even come to your ears. Indeed. I've heard much about all of you. Why, not only one elf, but two. And he turns his eyes toward Kiva. Is she meeting his? She's looking at him with the most defiant fuck you expression she possibly can muster. Hmm. It has been indeed quite a while since I've enjoyed, well, descendants of the Feywild in my lands. Elves are beautiful creatures. And such ancestry is terrible to be lost. You especially are a particularly striking individual. It would be a tragedy should such immaculate elven beauty be lost. Uh, I will need you to make a... Uh, do the same thing, please, if you don't mind ch setting your public role to private. Oh and my god. <laughs> All right. Metreon's gaze is very obviously averted. He's cocked his head to the side and has, has his hand over uh, like the temple and uh, side of his face and is like obviously covering his, his face and shielding himself from Strahd's gaze. Strahd immediately turns to uh, Metreon and Amity beside him and for the two of you metrion and amity if i'm not mistaken i must confess i'm intrigued at your heritage i'm sure you would agree that darkness in one's ledger is nothing to be ashamed of and you said metrion is averting his gaze yes uh and amity nods and says i i agree Thank you. All right, and is Amity meeting his gaze, or is she also averting it? Uh, she will look up and meet his gaze. All right. He meets your eyes, and his gaze softens for a moment. My condolences for your recent injury, or at least by the looks of it, it does seem to have happened quite as of late. I do hope that you have taken well to your new handicap. I have heard that the adjustment period can be quite harsh. I'll need you to uh, make a private GM roll, please, Amity. Uh, wisdom saving throw. 
Uh, thank you, my lord. Do you know? Uh, do you know where I can fix it? There is the wisdom safe. All right. Thank you. He smiles faintly. I'm afraid not, but perhaps in time I shall look into your infirmity. I can be quite generous to those I consider friends of Castle Ravenloft. Uh, thank you. He smiles, and for a moment, uh, Lillison, you can see the faintest bit of a uh, fang poking out from the uh, base of his lip. Hmm. Regardless, it has been a pleasure to meet all of you, and I'm sure that our first meeting shall not be the last. With that said, I must say... I would like to get a better look at you before, well, before we go our separate ways. If you don't mind, uh, Kiva, Erthrandir, and Amity as best you can, you interest me. Step forward so I can have a closer look. Kiva steps forward right away and walks over to him with uh, sort of a smile on her face. Uh, Amity follows. Uh, uh, Metron reaches out for Amity. What are you doing? He he wants me to come forward. That doesn't mean you have to do it. Uh, Amity's going to try to pull away from Metreon. Uh, uh, Kiva will offer her a hand to help her forward. Would you like uh, Truffle to come along as well? That's that's the the pig. It Amity is your decision. I certainly don't mind having a, an additional companion along. Uh, along? Um, uh, all right. So Amity, Amity will indeed gesture trouble uh, forward. Amity, you no. Know. Hey, leave her be. She's an adult. She Fuck you. Decisions. Fuck you. Fuck you. Amity, you have to come with us. Come on, stop. I wouldn't disobey him. The fuck are you talking about disobey? The fuck did you do to them? Strahd regards your gaze clearly. Uh, assuming you don't avert your eyes. Oh no, my! I'm still holding my hand up. Gotcha. Uh, shielding myself. Um, he glances right at you, but you quickly glance away before you can meet his eyes. They sim. I've done nothing. They simply know their natural place, and they are wise enough to know to exercise etiquette in the presence of their betters. Now, and he reaches out. Have Kiva, Erthrandir, and Amity. Uh, stepped close to him by this point. Oh yeah, yeah Kiva's right yes. there. He, yeah, he kind of stumbled forward. Metreon is trying to hold Amity back, but if she's wanting to go, I don't know if that'd be... Uh... Y'all gonna have to grapple? make a grapple check if you want to hold me back. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, but I, I, I can't. Uh, so that's strength versus athletics acrobatics, or what? Yep, I will versus you real quick. Is Kiva assisting Amity? Uh, Kiva, yeah, will assist Amity to get her forward. Uh, Amity, you have advantage. Oh, advantage, sweet. Uh, in that case, with advantage, Great. it is uh, 18. Yeah, 13 on the strength check, so. All right, uh, with Kiva pulling onto Amity's form and yanking it away, Amity hauls her grip free of yours. Is Mark, what do we do? For a moment, his Mark's breath is coming fast. His uh, each exhalation forming like mist in the chill mountain air. Hey, we could. He steps forward, hand on his sword. 
Devil, if you plan to do anything toward to them, I promise you will not live to see another day. Strahd meets his gaze, holds up a hand, his clawed fingers waving dismissively before him. Please. Master Kolyanovich, you embarrass yourself. At this point, he reaches out to Erthrandir, who's the closest to him, and traces a long claw down his cheek, reaching out and doing the same for Kiva and Amity when they approach. I wish them no harm. I merely wish to leave them. And he leans in closer as uh, starting with Kiva. His claws tug away at the top of her tunic, revealing the flesh of her neck. And he whispers, a gift to remember me by. Kiva leans her head down and allows it, but she's looking at Irina the entire time. Uh, All right. You suffer seven points of piercing damage plus 13 points of necrotic damage. And I will need you to make a, uh, another wisdom saving throw. Same as before. Private to me. Okay. Uh, does that mean my max hit points are down, yes? Correct. Your max hit points are decreased by 13. Metreon is just looking on in horror. Uh, well, sort of. Uh, still kind of keeping his gaze averted, but is, is horrified. Um, and is stepping back towards uh, uh, Irina and Ismark. He takes a long draught from Kiva's neck. You see blood dripping down his fangs. And when he pulls away, she looks pale. Parts of her skin looking somewhat faded. You can see her figure and form sagging. And he steps back, wiping his lips and beckons for Amity to step forward. Amity steps forward, but hold on. Is Kiva actually still conscious after that? He is. is she? Uh, just barely. Wow, barbarians, right? Okay, uh, in that case, yeah, Amity steps forward. As Amity steps forward, uh, Lillison, who is still staring at the ground, at Kiva now, uh, takes another step forward and says, Are we to understand that this is the customary greeting of all newcomers into your realm, Lord? Strahd offers you a small smile. You can see his claw tracing down the side of uh, Amity's chin, of her cheek around her chin, and then slowly tracing over one of her horns. And you realize just now, again, how tall he is, belying the gaunt features of his size. Amity herself only comes up to his chest. It is my pleasure to welcome newcomers to my land and my own methods. And he leans forward to take a draught from Amity's neck. No. So Kiva walks back over to the party and just sort of um, weakly leans on whatever she can find to stand up on. Uh, for the audience's benefit, Amity is 6'2", so Strahd must be extremely tall. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Amity um, will uh, tentatively allow this neck business Metron fires a, a bolt with him. Metron fires a bolt. Oh, oh my god! <laughs> Roll to hit. Uh, Erthrandir is going to cutting words this, if at all possible. Uh, let me take a quick look. What does cutting words do? Uh, well, he has to roll first. All right, Metron, if you don't mind rolling to hit. 18. Okay, then yes. Erthrandir Erth is going to use his reaction and turn and say, Come on, you don't want to do that. We're friends, and this is our best chance of keeping things civil and making sure everyone makes it out of this okay. You don't want this, Metreon. And with that, I need to roll a d6 and subtract it from your roll. Okay, that is a 3, so your roll is now a 15. That just barely misses. Metreon, Erthrandir's words cause you to stumble, your aim flying off just for a moment, and you watch as Strahd's hand as the bolt goes streaking just past his neck where you had been aiming. It said flies past his ear and his hand 
slashes out and grabs it, plucking it out of the air. He inspects it for a moment. Hmm. Shawdy craftsmanship. And he tosses it aside. DM, is there some way, like, just like looking at everything that is happening, is there some role to make to try to figure out what is going on with uh, Kiva, Erthrandir, and Amity? Uh, what are you looking to find exactly? Um, if there's any sort of, like, um, if this is any sort of, like, mind-affecting magic that, uh, Lillison would know about, or, um, you know, other, uh, any other effects mm -hmm. so that So, two exist. things. Uh, first, uh, look, looking around, you notice that Ismark has a look on his face that indicates, that seems to indicate that he knows exactly what's going on. And secondly, you may make an Arcana check if you'd like. That is a 22 on Arcana. Nice. You've heard of certain creatures, uh, undead among them, that have enchanting, almost hypnotic gazes. Those who meet their eyes have their wills stripped after a fashion for a time. It's quite likely that Zarevich has done much the same to your friends. Okay. Um... Lillison. There are limits to, given that you rolled a 22, right? You know that there are limits to this kind of hypnotic magic, similar to other enchantment spells. It's not domination so much as an exceptional manufactured trust. Okay. Uh, Lillison's fingers move a little bit, and then she seems to think better of it and takes a deep breath, looks back towards Metreon, and just gives him a tiny, tiny little nod. Strahd, what what is Metreon doing? I don't know Metreon. I mean, uh, he's paralyzed by fear, but seeing uh, Lillison, he's he doesn't understand what this nod means, <laughs> and uh, he's just like uh, he's holding his his crossbow out just because he's he's still frozen in that, in that position. But uh, he he's, he just doesn't know what to do at this point. Strahd sighs for a moment. Turns to the uh, bolt again, shakes his head, tutting quietly, and then turns, beckoning toward uh, his final target, Erthrandir. He sweeps aside his hair to bare his neck and bows his head. All right. He sinks his fangs in deep. You feel your eyes roll back as your flesh pales as he deals six points of piercing damage and 16 points of necrotic. Jesus. And with that, Erthrandir is unconscious. Holy shit. Your uh, hit points are, your max hit points are reduced by uh, 16 as well. Uh, oh, and I didn't mention Am Amity, did I, when he bit her? Yeah, and he's like, oh, d did you mean to bite me yes. as well? He uh, briefly does that uh, before Aerith and Deer, uh, uh, inflicting five points of piercing damage and five <laughs> necrotic, reducing, it's a shorter, okay. but he seems slightly distracted. Um, your max hit points are reduced by five. And cool. with that, um, briefly, he nods to each of the three of you, a small smile on his face. Uh, question, is Erythrandir still conscious? No. Alright, I, first I will need Amity to make another private wisdom saving throw for me. Uh, okie dokie loki, that is... Oh, wait, that was public. Uh, I guess that doesn't count. Making it private now. Okay. Alright, uh, he gives, uh, each of you a nod. And... Glancing down toward Erthrandir's unmoving body. If you don't mind, I would appreciate if you prevented him from bleeding out on my roads. And he kind of moves up to wipe a hand across his mouth. Forgive me, I can be a little overenthusiastic when greeting newcomers sometimes. Don't fear. He's not dead. Uh, yes, um... 
thanks for biting me a little softer. Um, Amity's gonna go try to medicine check uh, everything here. Uh, Kiva, are you assisting him? Yes, yes. All right, uh, with that, um, one of you can make a medicine check with advantage. I don't know cool. who has the better medicine. <laughs> Uh, that is a 14. All right. You pull out some bandages from your pocket and do your best to staunch the bleeding from his neck. You feel his breathing steady, though his face is still sunken and pale, almost skeletal. Strahd nods. Good. And one of his claws comes down to gently stroke Amity's horns as he fondly regards the scarring across Kiva's face. I have a feeling that I will enjoy getting to know all of you quite a bit better. And he steps back. But for now, my time here has pleased me. You may return your friend to the others. I do hope he survives the rest of your journey. You have a long road ahead. Amity swivels around to face Strahd. Uh, uh, great, then I'm, I'm looking forward to um, uh, enjoying meeting you as well. And she sticks out a hand. He regards it and then chuckles quietly. He almost looks intrigued at you for a moment. If you wish to greet me as an equal or a partner, perhaps that can be arranged over time, but not today, little one. And he sweeps uh, his cloak sorry. over his shoulders and chest, covering his hands. As Kiva stands up, she notices that he's got some blood on the corner of his mouth, and she tries to wipe it away. <laughs> he waves her off. No need to fear, my dear. I am quite capable. And he licks the little bead of blood. Delicious. Now, you may return to your friends. Kiva nods and then goes back to the others. You make your way back toward the group and Strahd nods. You hear Ismark grinding his teeth. You see Irina trembling and Ismark mutters, That bastard! Piece of shit! You hear the sound of the carriage door opening as Strahd steps inside. Oh. He pauses for a moment poking, keeping his head outside of the window. And I do hesitate to do this. I do want to make sure our relationship gets off on the right foot. However, and he pulls into his cloak, revealing his pale, clawed hand once more. And you see, clenched between his fingers, the crossbow bolt that Metreon fired. I do fear that if there is one thing I cannot abide, it is rudeness. You'll come to learn that soon enough. And you hear a snap and a splinter as he crunches the bolt in two, letting the pieces fall to the ground. Mitrion uh, shivers like his body just visibly shudders, uh, though his eyes are still facing, like he's still kind of got his eyes buried in, in the inner part of his arm. Strahd's voice is quieter this time. I am a generous lord, so I will give you three minutes. He glances to the dire wolves at his side. But when those three minutes have elapsed, make him bleed. The carriage door shuts tight, and the wolves snarl, growling, their hackles rising as they steadily step toward you. Uh, Metreon, uh, hearing the carriage door shut and the snarl of the wolves, uh, brings down his hand away from his face, looks around, uh, sees Earth and Deer still, uh, I, I guess, unconscious. Uh, Amity and Kiva both, uh, their necks wounded. Uh, uh, what is Lilith doing right now? Lillison is staring at this whole uh, thing. She uh, 
glances wildly towards Ismark and Irina and says, uh, uh, Attend to them, gesturing towards the uh, the three um, on the ground. And then she looks over at Metreon and she says, Run! Run! I'll be right behind you. His eyes start to fill with uh, a bit of tear and he bolts. Uh, she's going to bolt after him. Ismark and Irina nod, Ismark moving to do his best to help with Erthrandir, and as the horses neigh and whinny, the carriage stampeding, turning around and vanishing down the old cobblestone road. Ismark grabs your hand, nodding. Let's run. And Tia and Irina move to bolt with you. And that's where we'll pick it up next session. Holy oh my god. Oh fuck. my god. Oh my god. My heart is beating so fast. I I can't uh, right now. I truly like I don't even know what I'm feeling. Well, that I, certainly uh, happened. I need a break. Yeah, I need something after this. Holy shit. Um, I mean, now that we have like a week of a break, <laughs> Uh, anybody hey. else want to go to the bakery with me? Please! Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, <laughs> love, I'll be right over. Um, I'll, I'm gonna catch a plane, and I'll, I'll be right to you in a little bit. Um, holy oh, yeah, just give me a second. Hell. <laughs> See, I'm psychologically prepared for this, because I was in Dragnus last campaign, so... Um... You know. Linus, I don't know how you do it. I truly, like, you don't know how hard it was when Dragna messaged me, and I was like, fuck, this is gonna go against everything that Kiva is and everything that she stands for, and it is going to break me, and it did. It did. It did all of that. I felt worse. Linus, you didn't <laughs> warn us? You had, like, weeks and weeks to warn us. I, I wanted know. to hear the looks on your faces. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever warn us. Don't I, love you. I love it. I love the thrill. No, of that's this. accurate. Uh, that was so good, but also, oh my god. This is Wilson's gross. gonna have words sick. for all of you. Oh yeah, no. Metran is gonna read the house down as soon as you all meet up with them. If, you know, he doesn't get mauled to death first. So Wilson's gonna have words for Metreon first. Amity's gonna have words for Metreon. We've all got words. We've got words for each other. Just so words many. upon words upon words. We're very wordy people. Yes. Mm -hmm. Talk. Well, I guess if you weren't, you wouldn't be DMs. Oh, and God. on that note, uh, we will pick this up next week. So thank you to everyone for joining us today. We will Bye. see you all back in the... <laughs> we will all see you back in the Sorry. mist next Saturday. Uh, until then, stay on the path, avoid strangers in dark carriages, and take care. Goodbye.